Good Monday morning, everyone. It is 9 a.m. here in New York City. I'm Brad Smith alongside Shauna Smith, and this is Yahoo Finance Live. Here's what we're watching this morning. Merger mayhem. Alaska Airlines buying Hawaiian in a deal that further consolidates the airline industry, while Roche is snapping up a smaller pharma company with several weight loss-centric drugs in clinical trials. More on what these deals mean for the respective industries coming up. And Spotify is slashing 17% of its workforce the third round of cuts this year as the tech company looks to trim operational costs. Now, the news coming days after a downgrade from City when they cited concerns around the music streamer's revenue potential. And Bitcoin briefly tops $42,000 seen here at just below that level, reaching levels, though, not seen since April of last year. Investors are optimistic about Bitcoin ETF approval and increasingly believe that the Fed is done with rate hikes. We turn to our top story of the day, and that is two rivals are joining forces to better position themselves among a larger industry players. Now, Alaska Air is buying Hawaiian Airlines for about $1.9 billion. A deal would solidify Alaska Airlines' position as the fifth largest U.S. carrier. The big question, as we know, was whether or not this deal is going to be able to overcome some of those regulatory hurdles. And we know the Biden administration has been very active in their pushback against some of these larger mergers, especially there's concerns here following the pushback that the deal between JetBlue and Spirit saw. We had Merrick Garland there weighing in, saying that this deal is going to limit choices, driving up ticket prices. Now, comparing that to what we're getting here this morning, Brad, I don't think it's an apples to apples comparison because when you look at this data here with Alaska Airlines and with Hawaiian Airlines, it's pro competition and pro consumers. That's the argument that they're making. And I think it does have basis. It's more of a complementary business, especially when yeah. you take a look at the routes right now. And ahead of this merger, Alaska and Hawaiian Airlines, their overlap is only on 12 routes, about 3% of their total seats. So they're making the argument that, hey, this is actually going to be better for consumers because customers out there are going to have more options in terms of routes, more options for destinations. And it's also going to be just better for the business overall when you take into account Hawaiian had been struggling so much ahead of this deal. Yeah, absolutely. Quite the non-contiguous tie-up that we got here, you know, geography jokes aside. At the end of the day, one of the key acquisitions to really set this up and the trajectory that Alaskan Airlines has been over the past few years here, you think back to the acquisition of Virgin America even and yeah. some of the routes that they were able to take on there, added on about 118 destinations across the U.S., Mexico, Canada, Costa Rica, Cuba. And now for this and what they're seeing with Hawaiian, I think most notably it is coming at a time, and you're right to bring up the regulatory environment that we could potentially see. This is a regulatory environment that's already seen uh, scrutiny cast at the Northeastern Alliance that really broke up the American Airlines and JetBlue operations mm -hmm. and them being able to service so many routes that were on the East Coast. You also saw them cast scrutiny on the Spirit and JetBlue deal as well. And so all of this considered, it's still going to be with this larger overhang of what regulators might say, and they're perhaps going to be looking across a few things. Number one, chief most fares here. How is the consumer going to be impacted at the end of the day? And then additionally here too, when you think about that competitive landscape, this type of consolidation regulators are likely going to ask, just as they have pretty much in every big merger or tie up in the sky, whether that's U.S. Airways and American Air, or whether that's even what we'd seen most recently with Spirit and JetBlue, what ultimately this means in terms of the number of different cities and routes that are going to be serviced as well, because as all of these airlines have been bringing back on more capacity since the pandemic shutdowns and kind of getting that back to 100 percent in restoration efforts, it's also come with the larger question of how are they able to continue to sustain and see some of these profits and where are they passing that back through, especially to some of the workers that are operating many of these routes too. Yeah, exactly. So I think the uh, at least argument here from the side of Alaska Airlines and Hawaiian Airlines does hold just a bit in terms of the lack of overlap that we are seeing yeah. on these routes. And we talk about fare being one of the uh, big issue points that obviously regulators are going to hone in on. The fact that there's only a 3% overlap, I think, maybe gives uh, the argument strength to Hawaiian Airlines and also to Alaskan Airlines. Real quick, though, the other part of this is really what this means for M&A activity yeah. down the road. We have been waiting for a pickup in deal activity. We certainly saw it back in October. I was taking a look at some of those numbers here this morning. The deal activity that we saw just about two months ago, I guess now that we're in the month of December, was the highest that we'd seen the busiest month in about four years. We saw more deal activity last month, and now we are seeing that continue and trickle through to December. So how that sets us up 
for 2024, I think, is a focal point here and whether or not we are going to see a flurry of activity, a burst in activity, a surge in activity that we've been waiting now for for quite some time. Yeah, healthcare, energy, materials, some of the main areas that we've seen this acquisitive mindset continue to move forward despite some of the headwinds in 2023. All right, well, you are going to want to keep it right here on Yahoo Finance Live because later on in the show, we will be speaking with the CEOs of Alaska Airlines and the CEO of Hawaiian Airlines about this deal why it makes sense for the two airlines. That's coming up next hour. I'm pumped for that. Me too. Yeah, all what right. Great insight. Well, stick around for that, everyone. We're pumped. You should be pumped too. Alaska Air has agreed to buy Hawaiian Airlines, as we've been discussing, for about $1.9 billion. The deal solidifying Ask, uh, Alaska Airlines' position as the fifth largest U.S. carrier. But will it be approved by regulators? That's the big question we've been discussing here this morning. Here with some insight on this, we've got Mike Boyd, Boyd Group International President. Mike, we'll start there and just put that question to you. What's the likelihood that this deal goes through? It should go through. There's, it's really just a change in ownership, not necessarily merging airlines. So it should go through because it makes the, the two airlines stronger. It makes Hawaiian stronger, more cost effective in their operation. And it makes Alaska the same thing. So it's not a merger where consumers are going to lose an option. And that's why regulators really shouldn't be bothered by this. But I'm not confident with that. Mike, what do you think it's going to do to pricing, if anything? Should that maybe not be a concern, given some of the points that you just laid out? None, because there's no overlap. We're not going to have you know, one of, either of these carriers pull down any capacity whatsoever. Quite the contrary, they might have might have the opportunity of adding more. Uh, th this is a deal, not necessarily a merger, that really benefits everybody involved, including the consumer. Mike. Let's game this out a little further. Say it does go through as, you know, we are continuing to uh, evaluate and uh, the cases that these companies have been making, at least in press release, and perhaps we'll hear a little bit more about that case from the CEOs later on in this hour here. If this does go through at the end of the day, what, what can consumers expect from the broader kind of airline servicing operations that continue here in the U.S.? And, and especially at a time where a lot of these airlines, too, have been monitoring the international equation. What does that set up in terms of next steps for how these airlines are continuing to engage with consumers? Uh, for the consumer, it's not going to make a, a big hit at all. I mean, it's not going to change much like it's an ownership change. But the real issue that, you know, don't think there's going to be a lot more international traffic connecting over Honolulu. Mm -hmm. You know, 40 years ago, we had to stop for gas. That made sense. Today, Honolulu is in the wrong spot to connect any from, anything from the U.S. to the Pacific Rim. Now, for leisure traffic, maybe so, but it, it really isn't going to add a great deal. But it sure as de the devil is not going to take anything away. Uh, it's just going to make both airlines more efficient, and that's good for the customer. Mike, when it comes to travel demand right now, we know Hawaiian uh, Holdings, Hawaiian Airlines here ahead of this deal have been struggling. Their shares were off just about 50 percent, the slow return that, they, that they've seen in travel, especially among their customers from the Asia Pacific region. When you talk about demand looking ahead to 2024, do you see it improving uh, substantially? Well, I, I'm not I'm not really enthusiastic about that. I hope so. It looks that way. Mm -hmm. But right now we have a recession going, whether they say it's there or not, our non-recession. We have inflation going up. And for Hawaiian Airlines, which has done a brilliant job of making what historically was basically an ongoing bankruptcy airline into a major, well-run airline, it's a great thing. But the issue is they are dependent upon leisure traffic from to and from you know, the U.S. and other places in the world. Leisure traffic is the first to go. I'm confident this is work, going to work, but we may have some ugliness take place in the leisure sector in the first quarter of next year. Yeah, that, so, and we kind of heard about that from uh, Delta CEO Ed Bastian a few weeks back, saying essentially that the days of re revenge travel are essentially behind us. So what does uh, the airline positioning look like going into a period of perhaps normalization? Well, look at this. We, we, airlines are adding capacity up the wazoo into Florida, and that's all leisure traffic. And the flights are full. Uh, you know, we have spill levels in some cases. So uh, this argument that I was just making that the recession is going to cut down on, on leisure traffic really isn't upheld by the facts that are there today. What we don't know and this is a biggie, is what these new labor contracts are going to do, where you have 30 and 40 percent increases in both uh, cabin safety flight attendants or pilots. Uh, that's going to make a difference to what airlines can charge, and discretionary traffic is dependent upon what they charge. It's one of the headwinds uh, facing the industry right now. Mike Boyd, always great to get your insight. Thanks so much for hopping on with us this morning. Boyd Group International President. Thanks, Mike. Thank you.
Well, airline carriers are not the only ones making big deals today. We also got some news out of the pharma industry. Swiss drug maker Roche has agreed to buy Carmont Therapeutics, a widely known developer of obesity drugs, for $3.1 billion. Now, this acquisition allows Roche exclusive access to Carmont's current research and development portfolio. Now, this includes all clinical and preclinical assets. This is going to be an interesting race here because we have certainly seen, Brad, more interest in these obesity drugs. You have to look no further than Eli Lilly and Nova Nordisk for that to prove to be true. But what I like about this deal and what's a little bit different than what we've seen play out from some of the competitors mm -hmm. within the industry is when you take a look at Carmat's technology and exactly what they have for their assets, there's lots of talk about the obesity drug that we could see from Carmat that it could be an injectable or it could be in pill form. And I bring that up because that also then leads to the question of it could potentially be a more affordable drug. We talk about the fact that there's a lot of interest in it, yeah. but we don't really know what that uptake is going to look like because the drugs that we have seen when it comes from Eli Lilly and Nova Nordisk are thought to be so expensive. So if we have a lower price option entering the market, then maybe that could really fuel some of that speculation or fuel what is exactly needed for that mass widespread adoption. Yeah, that's a great point. And when we think about the broader kind of M&A landscape, especially as it pertains to healthcare, I was looking at how BCG is essentially kind of looking at the overall year of 2023 here, and specifically in healthcare, was one of their top line call outs, sustained interest in developing drugs, treatments in areas such as oncology, immunology, that's propelled deal activity. And then you have the GLP-1s, which has been lighter fluid for the space in looking to see where some of the R&D that's already existent could be either acquired in order for some of these other companies to be able to grow further or whether they could ultimately kind of look towards the consumer environment and say, all right, this has a lot of legs left to it, so let's just buy into this instead of trying to build something from the ground up. That's the case that we're seeing here continuously. But then you have some other acquisitions taking place like Pfizer and CGen, all cash transaction that took place um, valued at $43.8 billion there. So within the broader kind of IP, or not IPO, the broader M&A landscape that we've seen over the course of this year, despite some of those headwinds, healthcare uh, continues to be one of the hot spots, at least as of right now, for some of that deal making to move forward. Well, speaking of hot spots and perhaps some of the heat maps for where people are listening, I don't know. I was trying to tie in the you sound did a good towns. Job. It was a good, it was a good break. I'm still upset about the sound towns. I don't have that on Apple Music, but at the end of the day, Spotify, they've got that. A lot of people got wrapped, but unfortunately here, uh, a lot of people are wrapping their time at Spotify too, preparing another round of layoffs, unfortunately. This, the third one this year. The music streaming company is slashing 17% of its workforce, equaling out to roughly 1,500 jobs. In a 1,000 word essay to staff, CEO Daniel Eck wrote, the Spotify of tomorrow must be defined by being relentlessly resourceful in the ways that we operate, innovate, and tackle problems. Being lean is not just an option, but a necessity. Okay, so there are a few things to break down. Number one, this is a company that spends a lot of money to try and get top talent, retain them on their platform in order to produce content. And then on the other side, you've got the thousands of employees at the core of this business, making sure that consumers have that connection point for anything audio related. Um, but at the same time, they've, they've made some very strategic acquisitions and perhaps that's where they've been looking across the operation, trying to figure out, all right, where can they streamline some of the costs, cost discipline continuing to be one of the themes that's playing itself out. This is just cost discipline by a different frame or picture, if you want to paint it that direction, uh, as we've heard over the course of this earnings season. Yeah, certainly over the course of this earnings season, over the last few months, we have heard from a number of our guests, most recently Liz Ann Saunders on Friday, talking about discipline and how so many companies are very, I guess, taking a second look at all of their expenses, seeing where they can maybe potentially reduce costs. And you have to look no further than some of the moves that we've seen at Spotify. Of course, this begs the question of whether or not maybe this can extend the runway for profitability. Now, Spotify did report a profit last quarter, a bit of a surprise there to the street. So whether or not this gives them enough momentum to maintain that profitability is something that the street is looking at here this morning. We take a look at some of those recent cost cuts. It's happening at a time when Spotify is actually adding a record number of users this year. We have seen an explosion in popularity. Now, why this isn't exactly translating into margins is because of where they are seeing that growth. A lot of it now 
focused or coming from some of those developing markets, which is putting some pressure on the avenue rev uh, average revenue per user, forcing companies like Spotify that are in those consumer-facing businesses to adjust some of their costs uh, as a result. Now, Spotify being forced to do this for the third time, yeah. whether or not maybe they're going to have to do it again, of course, is something that the street's also asking. Yeah, the, we, we've moved from some of the loud cuts that took place yeah. at the earlier point of this year. You think about companies like Microsoft, uh, Meta, all of these tech companies, and now Spotify as well, uh, and from those loud cuts into the what's commonly become known as, as quiet cuts cutting here, but I mean, even these quiet cuts that are taking place at Spotify ringing pretty loud at the end of the day here with the scope and size of the layoffs, uh, but it just continues to paint a picture of corporations and, and companies, executives that are looking across trying to figure out what right sizing, especially in um, kind of an, an era of uncertainty going into next year and some of the increasing soft landing or mild recession calls that we're getting them trying to figure out exactly what they need to do in order to navigate that correctly, too. Yeah, again, the third round of layoffs this time affecting 1,500 employees, 17 percent of Spotify's workforce. All right, let's get to another trender today, and that is Bitcoin climbing even higher, jumping well above 41,000, briefly climbing as high as 42,000. You can see it trading in between that range now. So investors speculating the likelihood of a spot ETF and betting big on the end of rate hikes, potentially. We're always trying to figure out what exactly is moving Bitcoin here. Let's get over to Yahoo Finance. This is Jared Blickery staying by at the touchscreen for a closer look at some of the moves that we're seeing, Jared. Bitcoin rallying over the weekend. I'm getting 2021 vibes, uh, but let's take a look at the price here because Bitcoin was up for no particular reason uh, over the weekend, up 10% over the last five days. This goes back to the close last Thursday. And I'm tired of hearing about that Bitcoin ETF, the spot one anyway. It's going to happen. That might be a sell the news event, at least temporarily. But in the meantime, investors can really celebrate the higher prices. This is a five-year chart. This shows you record highs here. One of the things that uh, Brian Sazi uh, was noticing earlier today in our was staff memo is that the volumes just have not matched what we've seen before. In fact, if you were to look at the volumes not shown here, we are basically at where we were in early 2020 before the pandemic. Um, why is this perhaps not as important as you might think? There was a lot of fraudulent volume in here. And so I think those levels were very elevated. There was a lot of washing of tokens between stable coins and whatnot. FTX went south. Uh, lots happened in here. So I think it's going to take a new uh, normal. It's, we're going to have to find a new baseline to figure out what that volume is. want to show you the technicals in Ethereum, and then we'll get to gold real quick. Let me show you a year-to-date chart. Um, you can see we had this big consolidation area, and then we just broke to the upside. So just based on the length of this consolidation, I would say we have a ways to go in Ethereum. And now we got to talk about the futures industry because we got gold. These are prices over the last month. Gold is only up 3.7%, but it's getting headlines today because it is at a record, at least in terms of U.S. dollars. It's been at other records before. Um, this is what's happened this year, and we really got started in the middle of October. That's when this move got started. Guess what? That's when Bitcoin started breaking to the upside, too. And is there any underlying reason? Well, I'm going to point us to the 10-year Treasury note yield. Guess what started peaking and then going south in mid-October? That was a 10-year T note. So all of this has been facilitated by yields. I'm going to have a more in-depth discussion about how this affected stocks and the sector action with Maddie Mills in a few minutes. So stay tuned for the morning bell. But in the meantime, the bond market has definitely been wagging the tail, which is uh, or the tail has been wagging the dog, which is the rest of the market. Don't concentrate on that metaphor too closely. Your head might spin, but I think you get my point. <laughs> Jared, yeah, great point indeed. Uh, you already hit gold this morning and that record high that it's touched. But I'm, I'm wondering, across kind of the commodities landscape here, do we have anything on lithium? Because all the chat right now, yeah. all of the conversation over the weekend, it's still people talking about this dang cyber truck at the end of the day. And so <laughs> that naturally that takes the conversation or takes the thought over to lithium and what may be taking place there too, as that's core to some of the EV battery production. Yeah, for a lot of these fringe metals, as I would call them, there are uh, illiquid futures markets, some of them in Asia. Uh, I don't know, I haven't seen any uh, listed contract option with for lithium that has any kind of volume. Uh, and I don't really have that many indices for it either. So I don't have something on lithium to show you right here, but we can probably put some tracking stocks together and figure that out. There's also been a huge surge in uranium and people saying on Twitter, maybe that's topped. That's mm. kind of another fringe field that we don't necessarily have the tickers for, but it's something that's happened in the marketplace. And so it definitely does deserve some attention there, guys. Attention that we are giving it. All right, Jared Blakery, thanks so much.
We'll keep right here on Yahoo Finance. We've got all your market action ahead. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Let's get into some market commentary of the day. Steeple strategists led by Barry Bannister say that they see cyclical value stocks leading into mid-2024. Looking into the next decade, Bannister maintains his view of the S&P 500 as a secular bear market, saying, quote, we expect a range-bound S&P 500 in real terms to continue into the early 2030s. Here with more on this, we've got Yahoo Finance reporter Madison Mills. Hey, Maddie. Hey, yeah, it's never good news when you're not hearing a high price target for 2024, and then you add in, this is going to continue well into 2030 here. But that's the view that we're getting in this report this morning, uh, saying that there's going to be an H1 rotation from cyclical growth to cyclical value names. And what that means is basically that these big names we've been talking about constantly, that Magnificent Seven, is not where you're going to see growth in 2024. You're going to see it in a little bit more of these value names. Think energy financial services, banks, real estate. But because of that rotation, these are names that are not going to have as much weight in the overall S&P. So they're making the point that you're only going to get to a max of 4650 heading into 2024. And that's an interesting dynamic uh, because we've heard a lot of investors talking about finding that growth in these smaller cap names as we head into the end of this year. Uh, they're saying that that's also going to be what carries the market heading into 2024 as well, guys. Maddie, how does the Fed calculus here fit into his call? Because you talk about the fact that he does see a reason to favor cyclical value stocks as we look ahead to 2024. Of course, what every single investor and strategist is going to be asking an economist is really what that timeline looks like for Fed rate cuts. How is he thinking about that? Yeah, so they're saying no cut in March, which is interesting given that we are starting to see a little bit of pricing in the market, uh, more so for a cut in March than not. Uh, also, the argument here it, from them is that the S&P has already reflected what they're calling a COVID-warped pseudo-recession. And one key part of the macro recession calls, of course, is the labor market. They say that some of the corrections 
that we've seen in the labor market is just kind of, again, impacted by COVID, which is what makes this moment in time so interesting and so hard to call, right? Because so much of it is impacted by this once in a lifetime event where we saw a labor shortage followed by severe amounts of hiring and then a correction. Now we're finally starting to see a little bit more of a clear crack in the labor market. But their call here is that we already saw that pseudo recession. We saw it in some of the earnings reports. So we're not necessarily gonna see a hard landing heading into 2024. And they're thinking that the Fed is going to control that by not necessarily cutting in March. Yeah, it, it's been interesting over the course of this year, um, especially coming from Banny, Barry Bannister and his team. And they had been right about one kind of tale of, of two halves that they had forecasted in January, mm -hmm. saying essentially that there was going to be a rally early on in the year, but there could be some turmoil later on. That played out. But now, after November, we've seen many of the kind of broad-based uh, rally kind of re-ensue here. So their expectations here going into 2024, does that spell out to us mild recession, shallow recession? What are they kind of forecasting there? I think they're thinking kind of in the soft landing area, and that's why we have this mid-range target call in the 4,600 range, uh, which is very different than a lot of the other calls that we've been talking about, guys. And, you know, BOFA saying 5,000 with Savita Submarini in there, um, and a lot of the other banks hitting that five number. This is more of a moderate call, uh, particularly when you compare it to the J.P. Morgan Marco Kalanovic team uh, in the 4,200 range. Uh, this 4,600 number feels like maybe it's, dare I say, a Goldilocks moment, like the Fed is mm. maybe looking for here. Uh, so it, it feels like a little bit more of a middle of the range view. All right, Maddie, thank you so much for helping us break this down. We've got much more coming from you later on in the show here. But first, we got to talk a little bit about Uber. Uber joining the S&P 500 and its stock is jumping this morning. The uh, ride sharing company going to join the index on December 18th. And this comes after the tech company reported two straight quarters of operating profits fueling its rally. Its market cap is over $118 billion. It is a company that has essentially, essentially been verbified here where you're looking for a ride share or perhaps just looking for some food to get delivered and don't want to leave your couch. At the end of the day, for Uber and what they've been able to see, and we've seen some household names make their way into the S&P 500 over the course of this year, whether it is Uber, whether it is, um, as we've been tracking, even Lululemon, some of the gains and advances that these companies have made um, in the kind of modern lexicon of, of household purchasing habits right now, uh, none more so than Uber. It's just a larger question for this company, as it has been since they went public, what would that sustained profitability look like here for them? And uh, it's been it's been quite the story to track, but as of right now, they've uh, been able to kind of remain in cruising territory over the past few months here, uh, hovering around that $50 range. This company that went public at about $41, $42 a share, I believe it was. Yeah, they started to turn a profit earlier this year. Of course, whether or not that's going to be able to continue yeah. is what everyone's asking right now. But in terms of the street's reaction to this, they see this largely speaking, as a positive catalyst. When you take a look at what has happened to other companies when they are included within the S&P 500, it tends to be a positive catalyst, at least within the short term. You talk about the fact that funds obviously tracking the S&P 500 are going to be forced to allocate some of their positioning towards Uber. So that, of course, would be good here for the share price, at least initially. And it's interesting when you take a look at some of the reaction that we're getting from the street. Oppenheimer raising its price target by 10 bucks a share. And when you dig into this report here, saying that Following the inclusion, they expect Uber to lean into growth and also share buybacks, which should then increase investor sentiment for growth return in 2024. So setting up Uber to be well positioned within 2024, maybe offsetting some of those headwinds, some of the challenges that we talk about that are facing some of those other growth companies, especially as we, I guess, consider some of the uncertainty and whether or not we could see a broader economic slowdown, what it means for so many of these companies counting on consumers going out there and spending. Yeah, as of right now, it's really one of the only kind of cross-border ride-sharing plays given the international footprint that they've tried to set yeah. up. Lyft does not have that same kind of uh, uh, optionality for investors that are looking to have that type of exposure. And uh, I, I hardly kind of doubt that anybody's going to immediately jump to think about Didi Shushin. However, um, I will say, you know, anecdotally, when I was in Costa Rica, what do they what do they fire up there when you're looking for a ride? Didi. Uber? Yeah. Oh, Didi. Okay. Yeah. Even though they do have Uber. Yeah. 
Um, and I got lost in an Uber there. But anyway, that's a different story for a different time. But at the end of the day, still, Didi, Uber, yeah. two of the largest players internationally here on that ride-sharing front, and Grab as well. Um, so we'll see. Yeah. Exactly. It makes it extremely hard for Lyft to compete, and that's why it we've does. seen Lyft trailing Uber now for quite some time. All right, we're just about 30 seconds until the opening bell on Wall Street. We want to do a quick check of the market. Sherry Blickery, Madison Mills, standing by with some of the movement that we're seeing, which is seconds ahead of the open, guys. Yes, 20 seconds to open here, and we're seeing healthcare. That's XLV. That's up. That's actually down 27 basis points. That is the least bad off here. XLK, that's tech, looks like it's going to lead the sectors down today, down 1.21% in the pre-market. All this green you see in the background, that was what happened Friday. So in a few seconds here, these are, quotes are going to disappear, and then we can open up. But, uh, Maddie, one of the things I was talking about just a few minutes ago was that big drop in interest rates that we got in the tenure that started in about mid-October. A lot of the moves that we've seen and here, we can see that sea of red XLC, that's communication services actually trading to the downside the most. But uh, I was just talking about that. And if you take a look at what has been leading over the last month, uh, you see healthcare staples, real estate. Um, but, and then you go to some of my leaders and we are seeing uh, meme stocks, Bitcoin IPOs. It's just been a game of catch up here, it seems. And I know you're checking out the uh, disruption stocks as well. Yeah, I was thinking about Michael Hartnett's note uh, talking about distressed tech being a good play, not only heading into the end of the year, but also heading into 2024. And he specifically cited ARC. So I want to take a look sure. at ARC Innovation here uh, up, I think, 37 percent so far, yes. if we look at it broadly, right? And this is just over the last month. That right. ETF up 20 percent in one month alone. So that tells us that that call is potentially a good one, right, if we're seeing that much growth in some of these, again, growthier tech names. Uh, I'm curious how that at the end of the year is going to uh, potentially align with some of these bigger tech names in the Magnificent Seven, uh, or are we going to just continue to see more growth in these smaller distressed tech names in this last month of the year here? Yeah, that brings up a really good point, and something I've been kind of trying to wrap my head around is that with all the talk about the Santa Claus rally, we have seasonality, which favors the bulls into the end of the year, and it really has worked out well this year, except for maybe a couple months in between. It wasn't exact, but seasonality has been the play. Yet we got so much of, a, of this rally in uh, November, it begs the question, well, did we get it for Thanksgiving? Did that bring all this forward? Do we still have the possibility of a, a rally into the year end? And you were the one who taught me about the January effect, Jared, <laughs> this idea that small caps are really growthy towards the end of the year and then even more so in that first month of the year. So I'm curious whether or not that's going to continue to be the story or if enough of that is going to get priced in to this Santa rally that we won't see as much of that next year. Yeah. And just to show you what small caps have done and also the S&P 500 equal weighted. So this isn't like the market cap weighted, which favors the magnificent, magnificent seven, truly equal weighted. And we can see how it just came along live right at the end of October. And that's when all these disruption stocks started trading to the upside. It was as if everybody on Wall Street said, all right, we got to meet our benchmarks by the end of the year. Right. Let's load up on the lag laggards with leverage and uh, hope for the best, right? Yep. Something like that. <laughs> Something I, like that. I think that's <laughs> how it played out on Wall Street. I don't know. I think that's how they make their calls. <laughs> yeah, but we don't know. <laughs> Back to you guys. Jared and Madison, thanks so much for that insight. Of course, we're going to be talking about maybe ways to play this market going forward. But Mike Wilson uh, from Morgan Stanley was also out with an interesting note this morning talking about the outperformance that he at least uh, anticipates that he will see in the first half of next year. We also will have a big week for the labor market data that's ahead of us. Job openings to unemployment claims and two different payroll reports. Investors are going to be on the lookout for more evidence of a soft landing scenario. So how should investors be positioning their portfolios? We want to bring in Brent Schuette. He's Northwestern Mutual Wealth Management's company chief investment officer. Brent, it's good to see you. So lots of speculation about whether or not we are going to see a soft landing, how exactly the job market, the cooling that we're seeing there fits into that narrative. How are you looking at that? Yeah, I think, unfortunately, I think a soft landing is unlikely. I don't think the Fed is ready to declare victory on inflation yet. And so all these rate cuts that are being priced in in the market, I don't think they actually happen unless you see a recession. To me, the Fed is still worried about wage growth. Wage growth is in the low four to mid four percent. And they would like to see it back to 3.2 to 3.5 percent to feel comfortable that they have extinguished the last embers of inflation. At least historically, the only way that has occurred is through job losses. And you are starting to see the labor market weaken, which I think you'll see more evidence of in this week's report. And so for the Fed, that's going to be continuing to look for that evidence as they've been able to lean on the employment market thus far for some of their 
inflation combating moves more notably here. When we think about what you would be looking for that would signal to the Fed that, okay, now perhaps we should be more aggressively thinking about beyond just holding steady what a cut may look like at some point next year. Yeah, I, I don't think they cut until they see that labor market crack. And unfortunately, once the labor market cracks, it tends to trend. Mm -hmm. And so at least historically, when you've seen uh, the unemployment rate on a three-month moving average rise 0.5% or more above the prior 12-month low, the next stop, at least back to World War II, has been an increase in the unemployment rate of 1.9% or more. Now, that doesn't mean it has to happen, uh, but it has in the past. And I still think it's likely it does this time, just as you see the Fed keep uh, the pressure on the economy and the labor markets. Uh, and that's the reality that I think is going to happen over the coming quarters. Uh, and you'll see that job market uh, continue to weaken, which you're already seeing signs. Continuing claims are up 24 percent year over year, for example. We have never not had a recession, at least the last eight, when it's at that level. And so I think you're seeing more and more evidence that companies are beginning to look at cost, are starting to cut labor. Uh, and that's going to be a trend that I think continues into the beginning part of 2024. Yeah, we certainly are seeing companies uh, become a bit more disciplined when it comes to costs. So then, Brent, what does this mean then for investment portfolios? Should people be maybe getting a bit more defensive in their positioning ahead of this uncertainty? Yeah, I mean, certainly we've increased our bond allocation over the prior few uh, uh, quarters as we think bonds offer real value, uh, especially uh, in a hedge against equity markets, especially equity markets that are down because of a recession. And so certainly the bond market, even though it has rallied quite a bit over the past month, still offers value for investors. I think it's kind of an interesting point to think about that the market may have discounted some of a recession already. And so I think small and mid-cap stocks, I think, will do well towards the, the later half of 2024 as you come out of that recession. And I think there's already some evidence that you could say small caps and mid-caps have discounted some sort of an earnings decline, some sort of a recession uh, with their price action much more limited uh, than the S&P 500, which is considered to be higher quality uh, and more defensive in nature. And so I guess to me, all is not lost for equity investors. I do think there are opportunities in the market. Uh, I just think those are likely to be uh, you know, amplified and brought to life as you push throughout 2024 and into the back half of the year. Do you believe that the beginning of 2024, as we're kind of thinking about perhaps some investors' New Year's resolutions out there, uh, does 2024 bring a, a hard reset to any portfolio positioning? Or is there a different kind of top idea that you believe is going to emerge? I think leadership changes. If you look back in every economic cycle going back into the 70s and 80s, uh, leadership in the market has changed. And so I don't think that investors will be talking about the ARC holdings that you mentioned. We'll be talking about technology uh, and growth stocks. I do think there's other values and other opportunities in small and mid caps. And I think even international equities, I heard uh, earlier talking about a dollar weakness. I think over the next few years, the dollar will be weaker. And I think that's a tailwind to international uh, economies and their stocks. And so the, the New Year's resolution should be don't abandon diversification, focus on any one part of the market, uh, including those that have done well recently, because I think leadership will change as you push into a new economic cycle that is brought upon by the end of a recession. All right. And we appreciate uh, your insight there. And of course, the New Year's resolution, what investors should be considering there as we count down to December 31st. Brent, thanks so much. Brent Judy, Northwestern Mutual Wealth Management's Chief Investment Officer. Well, so Richard Branson is bringing Virgin Galactic back to Earth, saying that he's no longer going to add more money, invest more money into the space company, at least for now. In an interview with the Financial Times, Branson saying, quote, we don't have the deepest pockets after COVID and Virgin Galactic has got nearly a billion dollars. It should, I believe, have sufficient funds to do its job on its own. Now, last month, the space company did cut jobs. They also suspended commercial flights for about 18 months to help preserve some of that cash for development of a larger plane that's going to be used, hopefully, to carry passengers to the edge of space. This is a bit concerning, though, for investors here, Brad. You never like it when you hear the owner, the founder, uh, saying that they are not going to be investing any more money into the company, at least for now. And this is a company that requires a heck of a lot of capital, want to just stay relevant and compete with some of the rivals, some of the other startups that are out there. But obviously, to be successful in these launches down the road, they're going to need a heck of a lot of money. If you don't have Branson willing to pour more money in, you're asking what the future of this company looks like. Yeah, some big questions, especially even on business updates that they just gave at the beginning of November, talking about the Galactic 06, uh, oh, excuse me, 06 space flight mission planned for January 2024. Uh, up in the air as to whether or not that's going to happen. Spaceship Factory in Phoenix, Arizona, they were talking about open that midway through next year. Requires a lot of capital to do that. Also, production schedule for the Delta-class spaceships, they said at the time it was on track 
for revenue service in 2026. That a longer term target. But then at the end of the day here, even if Sir Richard Branson is saying that the company should have enough capital to operate as it needs to right now, I think for some of the larger ambitions and at the price tag that they're expecting to make these flights possible here, of which they only completed six space flights over six months with positive customer feedback they did add in this most recent earnings report. At the end of the day, it's going to be a much higher frequency that these companies have to, any company that's going to, you know, suborbital or even um, kind of that orbital level of space travel and tourism, a tourism industry that still is going to be extremely expensive at the outset. You're going to have a limited amount of people that actually want to spend upwards of two hundred to $250,000 for a ticket to this. My goodness, why not just put a down payment on a house at the end of the day? And then additionally, you think about ultimately how this company is going to maintain a profit over time. There's so many questions because of how much it actually costs to run these flights. This is a company that's still operating at a net loss here, net loss of $105 million compared to $146 million net loss in the third quarter of 2022. So sure, trimming some of the losses, but still hundreds of millions of dollars in losses that this company could continue to see and the absence of injection of capital from one of the billionaires of the world has become uh, uh, known and investing in some of the more innovative space or just broader travel industry as well. Yeah, there could be one less billionaire, I guess, in the space race when you talk about the fact that Bezos with Blue Origin, Elon Musk with SpaceX, they are pumping money into their firms, at least for now. So yeah. giving them a bit of an edge, at least when you compare it to Virgin Galactic today. All right, keep right here on Yahoo Finance. We've got all your market action ahead. We'll be right back. AI has been the dominant theme in the market this year, with NVIDIA leading the charge. The stock is more than tripled. AI enthusiasm has also contributed to tech leading market gains overall. But now it's raising questions about whether it's gotten too expensive. NVIDIA, for example, has a forward price to earnings ratio of 38 versus about 30 for the broader tech universe and 20 for the S&P 500. Does it belong in your portfolio? And if not, how do you play AI? We'll tell you in our new Yahoo Finance series, Goodbye or Goodbye. Three times a week, you'll get insights from investing pros on how to build your portfolio.
Another pharmaceutical giant is rejoining the obesity drug race. Roche is taking over drug developer Carmart Therapeutics in a bid to challenge Novo Nordisk and Eli Lilly. Now, this deal marks Roche's return to the weight loss market, the Swiss drug maker abandoning its GLP-1 field back in 2018 after its subsidiary sold the rights to an experimental pill to Eli Lilly. Now, pharma company is continuing to pile into the obesity drug market with GLP-1s, but let's remember it's not the only treatment to combat obesity. Our next guest is looking to end obesity with a different approach. We want to bring in Dr. Shantanu Gore. He's a Lurian Technologies founder and CEO. It's great to see you here. So before we dig into what your treatment exactly looks like, I'm curious to get your perspective on Roche buying Carmat, uh, Carmat Technologies, the increase in focus on this race for di or race for obesity drugs, how that's changed your playbook or your approach to treating obesity. Well, it's it's been a great boon for our business. You know, seeing obesity in the news every day and so much interest from investors, patients, and providers has been a breath of fresh air in the obesity space over the past decade. And I want to underscore one thing. I really do believe these medications are great tools for patients who have obesity, but they are not going to be the cure for obesity. If you think about blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, we have hundreds of drugs to treat these chronic diseases, but yet they still are very, very prevalent uh, all over the world. And the reason is uh, many of these drugs require lifelong use, and we all know that adherence rate to medications is extremely low, even with GLP-1s two-thirds of patients who start a GLP-1 drug will stop within the first year. And so there's a lot of work ahead of us when it comes to medications, and I really believe that they are not going to be the single long-term cure-all for the obesity epidemic. So do you believe that people and the broader consumer environment that has in some form or another cozied up to GLP-1s or other obesity and, and weight loss drugs, do you think they fully understand what they're getting into in these cases then. I mean, when you're talking about you have to continue to take this over an extended period of time, if not for life, as I believe you just mentioned a moment ago, then what type of long-term implications are we talking about? What other types of uh, conditions could, could arise more broadly among the cohort uh, that, is, that is taking on some of these drugs? There's a series of issues here. I think the general public and patients in general don't realize uh, that once you stop taking these drugs, the weight can come right back on. There's not enough of a focus on behavior change and lifestyle modification, and that's one thing we pride ourselves on at Allurion, combining these tools with best-in-class behavior change so people can actually change their lifestyle and actually keep this weight off in the long run. You know, With these drugs, too, being used at higher doses than they've ever been, there's really no long-term data on what happens to patients after several years or several decades of therapy. There's already some indications that these drugs may have uh, impacts on thyroid cancer incidents or pancreatic cancer incidents or a host of other diseases that could actually give rise to even bigger problems for patients who have obesity. So there are a lot of unknowns out there, no doubt about it. These drugs have been a great boon for many, many patients, and they've created a ton of awareness uh, amongst millions of people around the world who are struggling with obesity, but they are not going to be the be-all, end-all in the obesity epidemic. There's going to be a requirement, really, for different so sorts of therapies for different sorts of patients. And then there's also the affordability aspect of all this. I'm curious how you're approaching this and trying to make your offering, I guess, accessible to as many people as possible. Well, at Allurion, we, we don't believe that you need to be on a medication or a device or, or a drug mm -hmm. for your entire life. We believe that through lifestyle modification and behavior change, you can actually keep the weight off in the long haul. And so what we've developed at Allurion is a device that you can swallow in a 15-minute office visit. It's a balloon that sits inside your stomach, helps you feel full. And that balloon disappears after four months. And in that four month period of time, we help you change your lifestyle, modify your behavior through artificial intelligence. We have something called Coach Iris, which is a 24 seven weight loss coach there to answer all of your questions that you have as you go through your weight loss journey. And we have a behavior change program, proprietary behavior change program that we've developed in-house at Allurion that's delivered through our mobile platform so that patients actually can get the type of coaching, the type of behavior change and lifestyle modification advice and counseling that they need. And our patients will lose 30 pounds of weight or 15% of their total body weight in just four months. It's a very fast weight loss when you have a balloon like this sitting inside your stomach helping you feel full. 
and they'll maintain 95% of that weight loss at one year. So unlike these drugs, when our balloon disappears from your stomach, it's not like the weight comes right back on. But if you're taking a GLP-1 drug, the moment you stop injecting yourself, you're going to see the weight come back with a vengeance. Is the balloon collecting data? I I'm sorry if this is a dumb question, but I mean, there are so many kind of conversations that we've continued to hear around um, embeddable technology. And I mean, the balloon disappears. So I guess, you know, it's, it's limited in scope how much data it would be collecting. But is there kind of a, a collection that takes place on top of that, that is allowing people to have kind of better example of their biometrics. Can you just kind of explain how this works? Yeah, we're collecting actually a lot of useful data that our providers and patients find incredibly valuable. Every patient who gets our balloon gets our Bluetooth scale. Uh, they get our uh, health tracker smartwatch if they have their own wearables like an Apple Watch or a Fitbit that works with our platform too. And so we're able to track patients' weight their activity, their exercise, their sleep, uh, and you know, monitor all of that as they go through their weight loss journey. We make that data available to the provider who actually gave them the balloon so that provider can actually track those patients in real time and intervene if there are any issues as the patient goes through their weight loss journey. And on top of all of that data, we have a very powerful suite of machine learning algorithms and an AI platform that's constantly combing through the data, looking for patients who might not be on track for success. One of our machine learning algorithms can actually predict within the first 20 days of someone getting our balloon, mm -hmm. what their four month outcome is gonna look like. And so the data that we've collected is incredibly powerful. As of now, the balloon is not collecting any data or transmitting anything back to the app, right. uh, but TBD and stay tuned on that front. All right, watch out grapes market. Here comes the balloon. Dr. Shantanu Gore, who is the Allurion Technologies founder and CEO. Thanks so much for joining us here this morning. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Certainly. We've got all your markets action ahead. Stay tuned, you're watching Yahoo Finance. A U.S. warship shot down three drones in self-defense during an attack that struck several commercial ships in the Red Sea. Now, Yemen's Houthi movement claimed responsibility for attacks on two of the commercial vessels, claiming that Israeli ships rejected warnings. Now, U.S. Central Command in a statement noting that they believe the Houthi attacks were fully enabled by Iran. With more on what this means for tensions in the Middle East and beyond, we want to bring in Yahoo Finance's Rick Newman. And Rick, when you take a look at these attacks, it points to obviously just further escalation. Right. Uh, this is part of a pattern. Uh, so the, the Houthis are a sect of Shiite Muslims in Yemen uh, 
Uh, and it's it's worth looking at a map if you want to understand um, what's going on here. Yemen is south of Saudi Arabia, and it's like a thousand miles from Israel. I mean, it does not border Israel or even remotely border Israel. Uh, and what they seem to be doing, uh, they have already fired some missiles toward Israel, and they seem to be uh, targeting ships in the Red Sea, which is between Yemen and Israel, that uh, they think or they say have some uh, Israeli ownership or are linked in some way uh, to Israel. So there's at least this one ship, the USS Kearney, that is parked in the Red Sea and is in a position to shoot down drones and missiles, although, as you pointed out, Sean, a, a couple seem to have hit uh, commercial ships. So um, the first thing I look at anytime there seems to be some escalation of this uh, war between Israel and Hamas is oil prices. Uh, and they did not go up uh, today, so markets are not uh, uh, jumping to the conclusion that this is going to affect oil supplies. I, I think one thing it is affecting is shipping uh, in that part of the world. I think insurance is going up for shipping which for some products that have to transit uh, those uh, seas is going to make them more expensive. So this is a, uh, I mean, I don't want to say it's an explosive situation because this is not escalating to the point that the United States uh, seems likely to attack Iran. But look, it's, uh, it's just very dicey and um, this is, uh, you know, troubling. And Rick, that, that starts to get into this next kind of thought. What does this attack mean for the U.S.'s involvement in the Middle Eastern conflict? So what we've seen so far uh, is what you might call proportionate response. Uh, and this has been this has been going on basically since the beginning of the israel Hamas war. There have been attacks from militias that are linked with Iran on U.S. troops in Iraq and Syria. That, that seems to be ongoing. There are actually what there have been um, strikes back, U.S. strikes against those militias at bases wherever they're located. I think recently we even had what sound like some preemptive strikes. The Pentagon said they detected um, possible missile firings or rocket firings, and they attacked those bases. So if there's some kind of response to what is happening in Yemen, it most likely would be targeted at the these Houthis uh, in Yemen. Uh, now, Shawna, you pointed out the Pentagon says these groups are enabled by Iran. I think that's that's an important word, enabled. That does not say controlled by Iran, and it does not say that Iran is directing these groups to uh, target U.S. forces or Israeli assets. It says enabled. Um, so that that is a way of saying we're going to go after uh, these groups that are mounting these attacks. Uh, we're going to finger Iran, but probably not go after Iran directly. All right, great synopsis of uh, a situation that we'll continue to monitor. Yahoo Finance's own Rick Newman. Thanks so much, Rick. Bye, guys. Appreciate it. Everyone, we've got all your markets action ahead. Stay tuned if you're watching Yahoo Finance.
It's been a little more than a year since OpenAI's ChatGPT hit the web, setting off a generative AI revolution. But that's so last year. So what's next in tech for 2024? Well, more AI, of course. Whether we're talking autonomous vehicles, smartphones, healthcare, gaming, cybersecurity, AI is the future. With that said, here are three ways artificial intelligence will evolve in the new year. First, you can expect audio and video-based generative AI applications to start to take off rather than just text and image platforms we have now. Companies like Eleven Labs are already on the case offering audio-based generative AI capabilities, and more firms will likely jump in throughout the year. Companies will also be releasing generative AI models tailored to specific use cases. Those can include models that improve weather predicting, platforms for security products, and more. In addition to slick new capabilities, you can expect generative AI platforms to improve their accuracy. Companies are already working to cut down on so-called hallucinations, or when bots present false statements as facts, and they're only going to get better in 2024. If you thought 2023 was the year of AI, 2024 will blow you away. And here to talk about what's next in tech and the future of AI is Bob O'Donnell, Technal Technal Technalysis Research President. Bob, thank you so much for joining us. I guess for the first question, you know, just generally for 2024, where does AI go from here? It's already been a, a massive explosion in 2023. Well, you're right, Dan, but here's the thing to remember. Even though it had exploded onto the scene in 2023 and we got a lot of press and a lot of coverage and a lot of companies talking about it, the average person in the workplace, only a few of them have actually used it. So 2024, exactly to your point, is going to be the year when it really explodes because everyday people are going to use it. Middle managers in small companies all over the world, you know, all kinds of different people are going to start really using generative AI in a meaningful way. And that impact is going to be enormous because of it. So you're absolutely right. That's going to be the big deal for 2024 when we, when we at a high level, is that the rest of the world will sort of catch up to the tech industry and, and the tech press and really start using this. And, and it's just going to blow people away. Well, Bob, uh, in about a, a month's time, a little more than a month, uh, the Consumer Electronics Show, CES, kicks off in Las Vegas. We're already uh, hearing rumblings of what we, we might see. I guess, how will AI dominate the stage there in Vegas? Well, everybody's going to talk about it, right? I mean, you know, it's almost become a joke now at, at tech conferences if you don't mention generative AI like, you know, 10 times in the first two minutes. Um, and so we're going to see everybody talk about it. How it plays out at CES is going to be interesting because in it, I believe we're going to see more of an impact initially in business uh, than we are consumer. Certainly there's going to be consumer. And I'm going to talk about a couple of things related to that in a, in a second. Uh, so we'll see a lot of noise and we'll see people talking about uh, devices that can do generative AI. Uh, and that's going to be important. And there are going to be devices like PCs um, that I think are going to be a big factor in 2024. Uh, and of course, consumers and uh, businesses will use them. We'll see other gadgets. We'll see other types of services. Um, there's going to be a, there's a lot of startups uh, who are trying to make a splash in generative AI. You talked about audio and video applications. Certainly, we're going to see that um, at CES. So I think that's going to be important. But I think there are some other interesting long picture trends that we also need to think about for 2024. I, I just want to you know to your point about companies having to say something about generative AI. You just look to Apple where, you know, they didn't mention anything about generative AI. They kept kind of mum on that, did a lot of machine learning talk, but nothing yep. generative AI related. And a lot of folks were thinking, when's Apple going to jump into this? But, you know, NVIDIA was the, the big company in 2023 to dominate with their, their AI semiconductor technology, the graphics chips that power a lot of this. Was a gaming company. Now they're, you know, still in gaming, but headlong into AI. Where does that company go from here? Well, I mean, NVIDIA is going to continue to ride this generative AI wave because over the years, what they ended up doing was building up this platform of software uh, called CUDA. And CUDA is what all the developers uh, for these generative AI tools are using. And they're very comfortable with it. And there's this broad base of tools. And that's the advantage that NVIDIA has had that's made it so difficult for other companies to compete with them. Now, we are going to see big competition. And this gets to hints at to what I was hinting at earlier. In 2024, we're going to see a ton of other semiconductor companies obviously be going after NVIDIA. And, and the truth is the market is looking for more competition. It always does, right? So 
AMD this week has an event. Intel next week has an event. We're going to see, and we just saw uh, AWS announce some chips. We just saw Microsoft announce some chips. So what's really interesting is all the big traditional semiconductor players uh, are going to be out there talking about this, um, as well as you know companies you don't normally think of as chip companies being Amazon and Microsoft and Google. Um, there's going to be a little bunch of little startups too. I think they're going to be challenged, to be honest with you. I think this is going to be a case of the big getting bigger. Another big name is going to be Qualcomm, and this gets to the other theme I was talking about. 2024 is going to see the launch of AI-equipped PCs, PCs that actually can do some of the work that we've traditionally had to do in the cloud on the device. And that's going to make things very interesting. We're going to see a lot of competition amongst AMD, Intel, and Qualcomm. We're going to see all the big PC players, HP, Dell, Lenovo, uh, Apple as well, uh, try and get in there and talk about this next generation of PCs. And the timing is perfect because remember that a lot of companies had to buy PCs during the very beginning of the pandemic. 2024, it's that four year refresh time. So you put that together, I think that's going to be an interesting category to watch moving forward as well. Yeah, and Google's already doing that with their their uh, latest Pixel phones. They have the their own AI chips built in and they're doing AI, generative AI natively on the phones with uh, uh, camera applications. So it's really interesting there. I guess, you know, the, the last question that we have here is looking to the future. There's been kind of this shakeup at open AI. Are there going to be repercussions for that throughout the industry? Is is it, you know, a, a moment that kind of shatters the AI it build up explosion or, or is no, it kind of going to be business as usual? It's a fair question. I don't think it's going to be business as usual. And I think we are going to see some big changes happening. Um, but in the same way that I think we're going to see some of the bigger semiconductors end up surviving more, I think the same thing is going to happen when it comes to the companies building these foundation models uh, and doing a lot of the hard work behind the scenes. It turns out, you know, initially we were all told, oh, there's AI training, there's model training, and then there's what's called inference. And they seem to be somewhat equal. Well, in point of fact, Turns out building these models is unbelievably hard and unbelievably expensive, which means only the biggest tech companies can afford to do this. And so I think you're going to see a big shift there. The one difference is going to be the companies that those big guys have aligned with. So Microsoft, obviously, with OpenAI, uh, AWS just aligned with Anthropic. I think we can imagine that other deals. Meta is going to be an important player as well. Those big companies are going to continue to position themselves. And again, some of the smaller startups that are trying to build models, I think they're gonna be challenged. Uh, there's gonna be different ways of doing some of the work. You talked about reducing hallucinations. There's interesting technologies being developed, something called RAG, Retrieval Augmented Generation. That's a new way to think about how you build generative AI tools. All of those things are gonna have a big impact on the market. It's gonna to be tough to predict exactly how it goes, but there's no question we're gonna see those kind of changes in 2024 for sure. All right, Technolysis Research President Bob O'Donnell, thank you so much for joining us. All your markets action up ahead. Stay tuned, you're watching Yahoo Finance.
Welcome back, everyone. We're about 40 minutes into the trading session. Stocks, as of right now, you're taking a look at the major averages down across the board to start the first full week of December. This month has a long track record of posting solid gains for equities. So can we expect the same this year? Some even call it a Santa Claus rally. We've got our own Jared Blickery here with some insight on it. Hey, Jared. Hey, Brad. Uh, just for the record, the Santa Claus rally comes at the end of the year, last five days of the last five trading days of the year, plus the first two of the next year. Easy to conflate that with the holiday season. And that's what most people do, because really from Thanksgiving until January, heading into the month, you have this one solid, very continuous block of historically bullish uh, signals and historically bullish trending stocks. So the big question is, are we going to fulfill that destiny this year? Let's start out with uh, this chart, which just shows the seasonality in December, average going back to 1950, pretty simply calculated. You can see we get a little bump into the middle of the month, but kind of retrace sometimes, at least on average. And then towards the end of the month, that's when we get that rise. And that's when things really seem to dry out uh, most years with respect to volatility and volume. That's when traders are getting away from their desks. Um, and I did do a sector breakdown. For what it's worth, communication services, which is a relatively new sector, that does have the best median gains here. That's followed by consumer discretionary. That is the tech sphere, uh, excuse me, that is a retail sphere. I think probably fitting because uh, that is the Christmas shopping time and the holiday shopping time falls within this window. Financials, healthcare, energy, among the other winners here. And really, you only start seeing losers when you get to tech and real estate, both of those very interest rate sensitive. Um, let me just show a chart here. This is a 10-year T-note yield, and I've shown this a couple times today. I think it's very instructive. It just shows the power of the bond market. This peak here has coincided, and this downtrend has coincided with a huge ignition rally in innovation stocks like the ARK stocks and Bitcoin, a bunch of others, and that has facilitated this rally. And as long as interest rates don't spike up, and that would be a huge, huge warning sign, there's no reason to think that this cannot continue. But then also thinking about volatility into the new year, and this is going to get a little bit more longer term. I just want to show you the VIX over the last 10 years. Let me put that in a line chart so you can see. We are at very, very low depressed levels. In fact, 15 is kind of a divider line. It's not exact science, but below 15, that's when you tend to see the S&P 500 really in rally mode. And that's what this chart is about right here. This is the S&P 500 back to the beginning of the VIX in 1990. These red dots are when the VIX is under 15. And that you can see is concurrent with a lot of these secular rallies and stocks. And you can see in here, this was in the wake of the global financial crisis, a bunch of rallies. There was a one-off here in 2011. Uh, we did have almost a bear market down about 20%. Uh, and then the question is, is this something that portends future gains or is it that one-off that we saw here? I would say more than likely, we're probably gonna see some big future gains, uh, but the proof is in the pudding. And also that's very long-term. We're worried about December right now. And, Full speed ahead, I just don't know what that speed is going to be. Is it going to be idling to slightly, um, I don't know, a couple miles per hour here? Are we going through a school zone or are we going to race into the end of the year? I think we've already seen the big race, so I'm not expecting fireworks, but some bullish action nonetheless. So you think we're more in the school zone then, yes, Jared? Yes, unfortunately. All right. All right. Well, well, at least we're still moving forward, right? Yes, moving forward. The That's upside. the important part. All right, Jared, thanks so much. Well, we have a busy week ahead of with U.S. data and company results. Our very own Josh Schaefer is here to break it all down with what we should focus on. I'm guessing it's his jobs report. Jobs Week in America. Come on. Brad looks excited. It's Monday. So we got to get excited for the jobs report that's on Friday, right? Because there's, you know, little tidbits. Five days to talk about Yeah, it. little tidbits from here to, or here to then. But realistically, it's going to be that jobs report on Friday that's going to be probably your big market mover for the week. But a couple of other data points to hit on and highlight here. You have that jolt report tomorrow with job openings, ADP report on Wednesday. And then also initial jobless claims, which we've really been looking at the continuing claims recently, too. Those come out on Thursdays, and continuing claims have continued to pick up. So you're seeing the same people continue to file. But again, Friday, that jobs report is your key data of the week. I want to hit some of the estimates here that we're going to be looking for. This was as of about a day ago on Bloomberg, but you're expecting 200,000 jobs, 3.9% employment rate, which would be flat. Average hourly wage growth at 4%, notably down a little bit from last month. And really what that picture paints there is what the market wants, a little bit of a Goldilocks print, a little bit of a not too hot, not too cold. Jobs are, jobs are still being added so people can buy things. 
but not too many jobs and people making too much money where we might be able to, you know, keep inflation up. And the other thing, though, that I think I'm going to watch this week, one other thing I want to hit on here, guys, is just the overall rally we've been seeing, right? We saw the Russell 2000 really kind of take off throughout the last month and then specifically on Friday, rising almost 2% on Friday alone. And I wanted to bring up an interesting chart here from Morgan Stanley's Mike Wilson on a, on a look at earnings revisions and why maybe it might be too soon to be buying that Russell 2000 or small caps. So you see here earnings revisions breadth, small caps significantly lagging the S&P 500 and NASDAQ, one, or, or, yeah, the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ 100, essentially saying, well, if earnings projections and earnings revisions are why we buy stocks, because we're looking for those profits to come later in the future, we're not really seeing that yet with the Russell 2000. So maybe the rally shouldn't be happening yet. One other spin on that, hmm. look at the NASDAQ 100, Brad, sort of leading that chart that we were just discussing, right? Look at it every day. And that's, that's the MAG-7. The MAG-7 has done pretty good if you invest in some of these indexes, right? So you could sort of read that chart two ways of maybe we won't have a lot of breadth, but if the MAG-7 is going to keep leading us higher, it's not a bad time to be in the index. Outperformance of the large caps. All right, Max Evan, take your breath away. How about that? <laughs> Josh, thanks so much for breaking this down. we got a lot to look forward to over the course of this week. Let's continue the conversation here. One of the big debates among economists going into 2024 is the timing of Fed rate cuts. Deutsche Bank projecting a mild recession that will lead to 175 basis points in cuts starting in the first half of the year. Pretty aggressive compared to the market, which according to the bank is now pricing about 100 basis points of cuts. Here to break down this forecast, we've got Matthew Luzzetti, who is the Deutsche Bank Securities Chief U.S. Economist. Matt, always a pleasure to grab some time with you here. All right, just kind of broad strokes, lay out the thesis here for us, because you got some folks out here scratching their heads. Yeah, I think really what we've seen over the, for the market over the past week or so is this acceleration of focus on, on rate cuts. On our view, I think the Fed cutting rates next year is, is pretty clear. We have, as you mentioned, this mild recession view. The unemployment rate rises to about 4.5%. Inflation is on a downtrend. And in that world, I think it's very clear that the Fed doesn't think they have to sit at 5.3% on the Fed funds rate. They can begin to cut rates uh, relatively aggressively. And as the chart that you just showed uh, shows, actually, our rate cuts are less aggressive than what typical policy rules that the Fed would reference would suggest. I think where the big market debate at the moment, however, is, and it was set off by Governor Waller last week, how early, how aggressive might the Fed be willing to cut rates in an environment that is not a mild recession? If we get a soft landing and inflation's coming down, then can they still cut rates? And the market over the past week has taken the view, yes, they can, and they can do it uh, relatively early. And do you agree with that sentiment? I, I think that there's a lot of enthusiasm around it at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, over the past week, we've seen the market moved to almost price a full rate cut as of March. It's now pricing about 125 basis points of full cuts in, in 2024. I think you do need to see economic weakness to get a rate cut in March. Um, I don't think that under a soft landing outcome where it's just inflation coming down, that the Fed is cutting rates as early as March. I think that they're worried about repeating the mistakes in the 1970s. I think they're worried about easing financial conditions at the moment. So I think that in order to get a rate cut as early as March, which is, is possible, I do think you need to see economic weakness with the labor market softening and the unemployment rate rising about 4% by that point. So Matt, I think a lot of people are asking exactly what that weakness needs to look like. When you take a look at that unemployment number, in order for the Fed, in your view at least, to feel comfortable cutting potentially in March, how high does that unemployment rate, unemployment number need to rise then to? Yeah, I think they need two things. They need to have very clear confidence that inflation is on a downtrend and is, is on its way to 2%. And so in my mind, that'd be 0.2% type prints on a monthly basis for core PCE. And it would be the year over year rate for core PCE dropping below 3%. I think that's kind of just this important threshold for the Fed. If you couple that with an unemployment rate that has risen above 4% over a relatively short time horizon, it would generally be consistent with a, a labor market that's weakening and mild recession type dynamics. I think that that's an environment where the Fed is worried about whether or not they're going to be able to achieve their soft landing. Uh, are concerned and have uncertainty about whether or not a harder landing is possible and therefore would likely begin to cut rates. It is a Fed that's been able to lean on the employment situation in a tight labor market. How much longer do you believe that that could still be the case or is that starting to show some weakness from your purview? I, I think it's certainly starting to show some weakness, but it's showing some weakness from some extraordinarily tight and extraordinarily strong levels. Hmm. Uh, last month's jobs report was one where I, I do think that you're beginning to see some of the weakness broaden out. You saw the unemployment rate 
rise to 3.9%. We saw the diffusion index, so how broad-based our job gains really begin to decline. We saw permanent job losers rise. Um, and so all these, I think, are evidence that the labor market is very clearly slowing. I think it's critical whether or not we get continuing evidence of that over this next week. The JOLTS report tomorrow is really important. Obviously, Friday's jobs report is important. And then over the next several months, the labor market, from my perspective, is in this really critical juncture. If it stabilizes near these current levels, then you get a soft landing that everybody is very hopeful about and that the market's increasingly priced. But the second derivative on these moves is pretty negative. And if you continue to get a softening and weakness, then I think the market begins to get concerned about um, these, these somewhat worse modern session type dynamics. Matt, how tough is it to provide these types of projections given the fact that there is still so much uncertainty when you compare it, historically speaking, to some of the recessions that we have seen played out in the past, at least up until now, this situation seems to be a heck of a lot different. No doubt. I think, you know, coming out of uh, this very unusual environment from, from the, the pandemic, the fiscal stimulus that we've had in the system, the ability for households and businesses to lock in low interest rates, it's created tremendous uncertainty about the, the pass through of monetary policy tightening into the real economy and the impact that that's going to have. And I think if you take a step back in you know, two years ago, 18 months ago, if we thought the Fed was going to raise rates by over 500 basis points over that, that period, I think most people would have anticipated that we would have gotten a, a recession at this point in time. Certainly we were of, of that camp. Um, but it hasn't happened. It hasn't happened because the monetary pass through hasn't been as, as significant. Uh, and you've had an economy that is still healing from, from the pandemic. The question I think now just, just going is, does this tightening begin to hit the economy a little bit more significantly than it has over the past month, past year? Uh, we think it does. We think you're starting to see some evidence of that. It's been interesting to get some New Year's resolutions from chief investment strategists at, at some of the firms that really are, are looking across Wall Street, looking across the inputs of the economy as well, and trying to best por position their portfolios. But from your perspective as a chief economist, I, I would wonder, is the resolution to just let a recession happen so that we can finally get past it and on the other side? Because ultimately you have some consumer cohorts that have already felt like they've been in a recession, especially on the lower income quartiles for the better part of several months now. Yeah, now, now that has happened given price changes and given tightening credit conditions. But those outcomes would only be worse if we get a recession. You, you tend to have that during recessions, uh, unemployment rates rise, job losses tend to be concentrated at the middle and lower end of the income distribution. And so I do not think we should believe that they'd be better off if, if we do get a mild recession. The Fed is still holding out hopes, and I think it is possible that we get this soft landing uh, dynamic playing out where you get this immaculate disinflation, inflation comes down, the Fed is able to cut rates because inflation comes down without seeing those meaningful job losses. That outcome is far more likely than I thought 12 months ago. Um, as a result, we are more optimistic on, on how this, this plays out. Our baseline is still that you get this mild recession view of the world. But in terms of a New Year's resolution or what you would hope for, it really is this soft landing playing out where the Fed is able to cut rates purely on an inflation story and not because the labor market is weakening. Okay, I like that New Year's resolution. Matt, mm -hmm. thanks so much, as always, for taking the time here with us. Matthew Luzzetti, who is the Deutsche Bank Securities Chief U.S. Economist. Great to grab some time and kick off the week with you. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Everyone, we've got all your markets action straight ahead. Stay tuned, you're watching Yahoo Finance. Boeing is poised to have its first up year in four, and it's been one of the best performers in the Dow. Analysts have gotten more bullish, and the company recently bested its longtime rival Airbus with orders at the Dubai Air Show. But troubles at Boeing's supplier spirit, Aerosystems have dogged its manufacturing process. Are those in the rearview mirror? Is the Boeing rebound for real, and does it belong in your portfolio? We'll tell you in our new Yahoo Finance series, Goodbye or Goodbye. Three times a week, you'll get insights from investing pros on how to build your portfolio.
As we near the end of the year, what should you be investing in for long-term gains? Using things like free cash flow, price momentum, and shareholder yield, Ned Davis Research calculated the top stocks set up for long-term returns, with companies like Apple, Alphabet, and Exxon coming out on top. Brian Sanborn, Ned Davis Research Global Head of Investment Solutions, joins us now. All right, so we'll walk us through some of the findings here and, and why these particular companies really jumped out. Right, so as we were getting questions about next year, right, the um, election year uncertainty, as well as how to position for a potential Fed rate cut or recession versus soft landing, we wanted to remind our clients that not to neglect the long-term drivers of stock returns. So we looked at 200 different metrics over the last 40 years, including macroeconomic sensitivities, fundamentals, technicals, and sentiment. And we looked at the return streams, to each of those characteristics over time. And what we found was that there were five core drivers of stock returns. Free cash flow to enterprise value has been the most powerful driver of stock returns over the long term. It is a measure of valuation. Operating cash flow to assets is a measure of asset efficiency. Looking at accruals ratios, it's a measure of earnings quality, looking at the difference between earnings and cash flows. Uh, looking at a measure of payout, shareholder yield, which combines dividend yield, net debt reduction yield, and net repurchase yield. And lastly, looking at the price action, price momentum. Um, in particular, we look at the one year rate of change in a stock's price and taking out the last month because the last month tends to be more mean reverting. So, Brian, we mentioned the fact there in that intro, some of the favored stocks that include some of the larger well-known names like Apple, Alphabet, ExxonMobil. But what are some of the other additions that fall into the criteria that you just laid out that you're adding to your portfolio now? Right. And so in terms of the sector distribution here, there is quite a, a nice representation of different sectors from energy, materials, industrials, communication services, uh, the tech sector, as well as consumer discretionary. In fact, consumer discretionary and information technology are the two most represented sectors in this particular list. Uh, the types of names, as you mentioned, are some of those mega cap names, your Apples, Alphabets, ExxonMobil, but also names like TJX Company, Booking Holdings, uh, Marathon Petroleum, as well as Parker Hannafin also came out in this particular list. And so within this list, how much of it is kind of continuing to evaluate some of the economic inputs? I mean, we were just having a conversation about whether or not we're going to see a soft landing or whether that would translate into or potentially see a mild recession. You know, how much of that kind of changes where these top companies are coming out? Right. In terms of the characteristics themselves, and this analysis was done over the last 40 years, so it includes the global financial crisis, uh, the COVID shutdown. And so these metrics have held up over during those periods of time. And so ultimately what the story is, is those companies that can efficiently generate cash flow, um, who earnings reflect those cash flows, properly reward their equity shareholders through those cash flows, um, as well as the market recognizing that too, while not, not, not being overvalued. And so in these co particular companies, um, they have consistently generated those cash flows over time, and so that's why they're appearing in this existing list. However, if we do go into recession, there are additional factors you can bolt onto these concepts, um, such as earning stability, looking at the earnings volatility over time, as well as looking at metrics like uh, dividend yield itself, higher dividend yield companies tend to outperform during recessions. Brian, is that something that you're starting to do now, given the fact that we have seen more and more strategists, it seems like, coming out warning that we could, or maybe it's time investors do start bracing for some sort of recession in the first half of the year? We're not there yet. Um, so uh, Ned Davis himself put out a publication on Friday evaluating the, the economic indicators. Um, right now, we're just not seeing enough to indicate that a recession is imminent. The economic data are slowing, um, but NDR's U.S. recession probability model is currently showing less than 20% odds that a recession is imminent. All right, Brian Sanborn and Ned Davis Research is Global Head of Investment Solutions. Thanks so much. Thank you. We've got all your market action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
We want to take a look at a sell-off happening right now on the street and taking a look at the NASDAQ. You have the NASDAQ composite off nearly 2%. Some of the weakness that we're seeing really being led by some of those larger cap tech names. When you take a look at some of the larger names like NVIDIA off pretty substantially here this morning, Amazon off just about 2%. You're seeing that reflected in the NASDAQ composite with losses right now of just over 1.5%. Alaska Airlines has agreed to buy Hawaiian Airlines in a $1.9 billion deal. Now, each carrier's brand will remain distinct, but the airlines will operate under a single platform, combining into a 365 airplane fleet. Now, Alaska is the country's fifth largest airline, though holds far less market share than its rivals, United, Delta, American, and Southwest, the largest carriers here in the U.S. Now, the deal with Hawaiian will help close that gap. We want to bring in Ben Minit. Minikuchi. He is Alaska Airlines CEO. Apologies there, Ben. And also Peter Ingram, the CEO of Hawaiian Airlines. Ben and Peter, it's great to see both of you. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us here this morning. Congratulations on this deal. Thank you, Shana. We're really excited, and uh, I think it's going to be a really great journey for us. Yeah. Yeah, Ben, let's Aloha, talk a little Shana. bit. Ben, let's talk a little bit more about that, the fact that you think it's going to be a great journey here. Why does this make sense for Alaska Airlines? Well, you know, this uh, first, we have such huge respect and admiration for what Hawaiian Airlines has built over their 90 plus year uh, history. And if you look at Alaska and uh, what we've built uh, on the West Coast and in the state of Alaska, you know, these two networks com uh, complement each other so, so well. And uh, so when we look at uh, the entire Hawaii market, this is an $8 billion market. Uh, we will be the clear market leader in in Honolulu uh, and, and the state of Hawaii. So this this makes this very attractive. And if you look at the deal in terms of valuation, uh, you know this will be uh, EPS and Royka Creative in the first two years of, of uh, after deal close. Uh, and uh, and the other thing, it provides so much opportunity for employees and choice for customers. Our West Coast customers will have an expanded domestic and international platform. A resident in Hawaii will have more choice to fly, uh, three times more choices to fly in the continental U.S. So I think there's just a win-win here across the board. Ben, you know, uh, first and foremost, I got to get my hands on one of these shirts that you fellas got there. Very snazzy. <laughs> Number two, when Thank we you. think about ultimately some of the synergies that you're talking about here, it's in the form of people, it's in the form of aircrafts, and ultimately for customers too, making sure that they've got a seamless experience. You know, what does success look like first 90 days after this deal goes through? You know, one of the biggest things we have to do well, and we're doing something a little unique, Brad, uh, than other mergers, is that we're gonna keep the brand separate. And this is just because of the phenomenal legacy that Hawaiian Airlines has here in the islands. Uh, and, and so we made the decision early on that we would have a dual brand strategy. So one of the things that we have to really do well here in the months to come uh, and after the deal closes is to make sure that when we execute that it is seamless for customers on the dual brand strategy. And it'll be a dual brand customer facing, but it'll be a single platform in the back. So, and with a single loyalty program. So kind of like, you know, what other industries do, for example, the hotel industry, you'll have the Marriott Bonvoy loyalty program, but they have their house of brands, you know, different hotels underneath. So that's one of the things that we really need to do well executing out of the gates. Peter, one of the topics here this morning is the regulator, the regulatory hurdle that could potentially be ahead of you. I know you two are very confident that this deal will get done. Why? Why is that different than some of the pushback that we've seen amongst consolidation within the industry? Well, Ben talked earlier about how the networks are very complementary. There's really not a lot of overlap in our two networks. Um, you know, a big part of what we do is uh, flying internationally in the Asia Pacific region and our neighbor island network. And, uh, you know, Alaska doesn't participate in that at all. So it, um, there's really no competition concerns. And, and even in uh, North America, there's a lot of competition on those routes. There will continue to be a lot of competition on those routes. We only have uh, a dozen uh, overlap routes in total out of about 1,400 flights for the combined carrier. So uh, I think when 
the the regulators look at this deal on its own merits, uh, they'll see that it's pro-consumer, pro-competitive, and we're going to add competition uh, for the big four network carriers that are far larger uh, than the combined company will be even after the merger. Yeah, that dual brand strategy that you were mentioning a moment ago, too, that might go a long way to appease regulators. We know that's been an issue in the past, even with the acquisition that um, we, we saw Alaska be able to do with Virgin America many years back. And even prior to that, you think about uh, the company that is now American Airlines and how that was one of the sticking points and where regulators pushed back. All that considered, though, you think about the the airline and the, the, the fleet that you're going to be operating, too. There was just a massive purchase that Alaska Airlines had made of the largest Boeing fleet order in the 90-year history you noted within this release here. When you look across the aircraft fleet that you have right now, where is there more purchasing that needs to be done? And, and even the delivery schedule that you're anticipating as you're kind of consummating this deal, uh, assuming that it gets through. Well, we have a great 737 order book. I would say probably one of the best in the industry, uh, which uh, can supply our growth, uh, you know, through 2030 at anywhere from, you know, five to 10% growth. So we have ample airplanes to uh, fund our organic growth, which was uh, which was the plan all along. Uh, now, as we come together as two companies, it just gives us more flexibility. Hawaiian has uh, obviously a different fleet type. They fly internationally. They have a unique domestic network. Uh, that suited to some different airplanes, but our platform of airplanes will give us the ability to rationalize and optimize as we look at, at the fleet and what it needs to look like in the years to come. And Ben, speaking of that, looking ahead to 2024 and beyond, we talked about the fact for so long that there was this pent up demand revenge travel that has seemed uh -huh. to play out just a bit. What are you seeing ahead of the holiday season? And then when you're talking about those future plans for fleet, obviously a lot of that surrounded are driven by demand. How you see that shaping up as you look ahead to the next couple of years? Well, you know, demand is looking quite strong uh, for the peak travel seasons. Uh, so we're feeling pretty good about what we're seeing into Q4 uh, and uh, and into next year. Uh, that's still, uh, you know, to be determined. Uh, but we're hopeful that we have, uh, you know, the right capacity deployed for 2024 to match demand. And I think that's the that that's the key, uh, the key variable for us is, is deploying right capacity to match the right demand. Mm -hmm. And then you'll get the financial results that go with it. So we feel like we're in a good place. Uh, I can't speak for Peter. We're, we're still competitors before this uh, deal gets consummated. So I'll let him speak for that. Peter, go ahead. What do you see? Um, you know, we're feeling we're feeling good about the demand situation as well. Things have uh, have uh, recovered pretty well, so uh, I think it's going to be a strong peak season. We had a good Thanksgiving. Uh, we had good operations over Thanksgiving, which is uh, helpful. So uh, I'm really proud of all our team is doing to uh, compete in the marketplace. Yeah, it was one of the great callouts here within kind of this overarching look at you know, what's going to come about is, is also the investment in local communities. We know it's been a challenging uh, past year for Hawaii and, and some of the areas impacted by the wildfires as well. There's a lot of culture that's embedded within this Hawaiian Airlines operation here. What, what does success look like in continuing to make sure that that culture uh, is continued to be elevated here and the communities uh, that have benefited as well from the operation, that they're continuing to see that regeneration of tourism, that um, kind of added focal point here, uh, especially even as a deal like this comes together? You know, Brad, it's a great point. You know, we've been, uh, we've been in Hawaii now flying here for 16 years and over the years, our respect and admiration for uh, what um, what the islands uh, uh, represent uh, is, is very important for us. So uh, it's like what you said. One of the decisions we made right out of right out of the gate was to keep the to keep uh, the brand, the Hawaiian brand, because it, one, it meant so much uh, to the residents of Hawaii, uh, to the employees, and uh, and uh, you know we couldn't see a future without the Hawaiian brand. Uh, next, I, I think uh, we learned uh, from you know our, our history here that uh, making sure we take care of uh, of the islands, the resources that are here, and being good stewards is really important going forward. So that's something we're going to do. We're going to listen to the communities here. We're going to listen to to the people, uh, employees, to make sure that you know as we come as one company, 
uh, we're doing right uh, by uh, by communities uh, and 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 for the people who depend on essential air travel to get from uh, one place uh, and the other. Certainly, gentlemen. Just lastly, while we have you here, uh, it's been a massive year, uh, past 12 months for labor negotiations and collective bargaining agreements. We know that that's been the same case across airline pilots as well. And a larger question of where some of that may trickle through and impact either margins or even impact the fares that customers see here. How do you kind of go about this calculus and what ultimately do you believe is going to be kind of the, the pass through that consumers might need to take on in this instance now? You know, well, for, from our perspective, Brad, uh, you know, when we uh, analyze the valuation, uh, both companies come together, that is all in the, in the, in the calculus. Uh, so uh, we put that all in, in, you know, in the framework of what uh, it would look like in terms of labor costs uh, and overhead costs. So uh, we feel good about uh, what the economics look like, what the financial rationale is. So, um, uh, but look, I think labor costs and fuel costs are, are the two variables that uh, are, uh, you know, the, uh, the most impactful to our bottom line. So those are the things that we really have to work on and make sure that we provide a product uh, to customers that, um, that, that's compelling enough so that we are, we are the airline of choice. Ben Minicucci, Alaska Airlines CEO, and Peter Ingram, the CEO of Hawaiian Airlines. Once again, thank you both so much for sitting down and speaking with us. Congratulations. Thank you, Sean. Thank you. Well, 2023 has been a strong year for leisure spending as Americans continue to splurge on experiences. Cruise lines like Carnival, they've enjoyed roaring post-pandemic demand with folks eager to set sail. The stock up 50, uh, 58%, uh, almost 60% now here as we're taking a look at that year over year over the past 52 weeks and demand showing no signs of slowing down. Several Carnival brands saw record bookings over Black Friday as folks prepare for 2024 and 2025 travel even. But Vail Resorts hasn't seen the same upward momentum even as the upcoming ski season saw an increase in bookings, headwinds from weather still weighing on the company's bottom line. We're joined now by Paul Golding, who is the senior U.S. lifestyle payments analyst over at Macquarie Capital. Great to have you here with us. Uh, first and foremost, Paul, when you kind of evaluate these two different parts of the experience economy, where is there kind of continued strength that we should expect and where is the consumer perhaps wavering on the ability to spend into some experiences? Yeah, great to be with you both. I think when we when we look at uh, what's been happening across cruise versus ski, for example, uh, we didn't have the inbound testing requirement for COVID come off in the U.S. until August of last year. So there's some late tail international reflation that we've been seeing throughout this year. And of course, the, the majority of the EBITDA generation for Vail is uh, North America resorts. And so as we look at cruise, cruise has been benefiting, in our view, from some of these dynamics on late uh, late international reflation uh, and the value proposition that cruise represents versus land-based alternatives. We heard during the Q3 earnings call at RCL that uh, they continue to see a 35 to 40 percent discount versus land-based, uh, whereas pre-COVID that discount was about 10 to 15 percent. So as we look at, at that business, we see an opportunity for crews to continue to uh, drive price and attract demand versus uh, Vail, which we're neutral on and have been neutral on, uh, which tends to be a more premium product and is domestic and also has other structural things going on like weather volatility. So for example, most recently, we took our target price down $10 from 235 to 225 mm. uh, on the back of a late Tahoe start and weather volatility over the Australian winter. So a lot of different dynamics here, some demand driven, some supply driven, and that drives this dichotomy in our outlook. So, Paul, then what do you think Vail needs to do in order to boost that demand? Obviously, they cannot control the weather. So when you take a look at some of the pricing trends, some of the demand that you're seeing early on for some of the ski, uh, the, the season uh, passes that they are able to sell, what can they do then for the longer term in order to boost some of those sale numbers? Well, uh, their past sales uh, have been up. For example, they noted uh, at the most recent uh, press release that their their uh, past uh, units for up 7% and 11% uh, growth in dollar terms. Uh, but, uh, you know, the capital uh, plan is 
supposed to help with some of this by deploying more snowmaking machines. Uh, they did take a significant price cut, about 20% a couple of years ago on the pass base uh, and have been uh, growing it back from there in terms of price. Uh, and they've also introduced much uh, a much broader slate of pass products. So for example, instead of just a, an unlimited or a seven day or a four day, there's also now a single day, two day, three day, five day, six day. And so as you look at that slate of products, uh, it could help drive uh, uptake from those who are maybe not uh, as able to ski uh, in terms of, of day count uh, or who maybe are not as avid skiers in general, uh, but want uh, to, to pull forward a few days and pre-purchase them. Uh, but a lot of this also just involves skier uniques and growing the skier base. So some things like uh, offering ski school, which they do, uh, and their programs to bring in uh, younger skiers uh, could help over time. It's just competing with weather volatility and uh, snowmaking difficulty from a natural perspective in some markets. Paul, I'm so glad you mentioned all of this. We actually had the opportunity to speak with uh, world champion and gold medalist uh, alpine skier Lindsey Vaughn at Yahoo Finance Invest. And we asked her about whether or not it's getting too expensive skiing, especially here in the U.S., compared to some of the European counterparts and resorts there. Just want to play a clip of this, and we'll get your response on the other side. To take a whole family skiing in the United States is it's a small fortune. I think in the U.S. it's probably just going to continue to get more expensive because people are coming, and, you know, it's profitable. And so if, if that's the model that works, it's probably going to stay. So, Paul, according to your calculations here, what, what is the tipping point where some of the companies that, as they've been regarded by the ski community, have kind of formed this duopoly in the mountains here and among the resorts? And I, look, I can't even think about learning to ski at this point because it costs so much. So what is that tipping point for many households and, and those who are looking to perhaps grow the base of skiers, but at the same time just can't afford it or justify the cost? Well, we can only speak to Vail, which is what we cover, uh, but uh, skiing is very expensive relative to other leisure activities, for example, uh, crews, as we mentioned. Uh, but uh, there have been other strategic attempts that Vail has made to uh, grow the base, which is acquire uh, lower line, more uh, casual drive up types of resorts, for example, the peak portfolio. Um, has that been uh, a significant driver? Uh, we have to see more uh, of, of the demand base sort of trickle through from that. Uh, but uh, for us, the, the cost of skiing is something that keeps us favorable on things like cruise and neutral on, on Vail. And I think over time, uh, the, the question becomes also, uh, how do they leverage promotion if they even want to, to uh, bring in uh, skiers for the first time. This uh, uh, cohort of consumer tends to be higher end for Vail. Uh, and so in some ways that's helpful because it's a resilient consumer and they have mentioned in the past that that's favorable because it drives consistency in revenue period to period or year to year. But uh, in terms of growing the base, that's been a detraction in our thesis uh, from, from getting more positive on the name simply because of the, the, the cost of entry. So uh, not sure what the tipping point may be. There are levers to pull. There are other crosswinds that are out of their control, but um, some of this has to do with just the core demo uh, in terms of, uh, of the high-end consumer uh, that, that has the affinity for, for uh, going to Vail Resorts and engaging in ski activities. All right, Paul Golding, great to have you here. Senior U.S. Lifestyle Payments Analyst with Macquarie. Thanks. Well, the, the housing market has been in a tough time here, but it seems like prospective home buyers are getting impatient. According to Bank of America's Home Buyer Insights report out today, 62% of them are waiting for rates to fall to buy a home, and that's down from 85% in April. To break down the numbers, Matt Vernon, Bank of America Head of Consumer Lending, here with us. Matt, great to just grab you for a hot second here. We know that home buyers are getting impatient. So what are we seeing in terms of the turnover of people that are saying, you know what, 
I just got to get out there and, and see what's available and perhaps put some bids in. Yeah, hey, I think the stats that you mentioned um, are eye-opening because it's clearly illustrating that the consumer today that is in the home buying journey at the beginning in many respects is beginning to, to your point, lose patience with the rate environment because ultimately that dream of home ownership is alive and well for all the reasons that we've talked about in the past. So they're beginning to enter into it. I think the real important aspect of this, though, is the, the existing home buyers and ultimately the motivation for them to begin to list their homes as well. And there was some encouraging data in the survey as well there where homeowners are li looking to list their house um, more, more uh, specifically than they have in the past. In fact, 50% of home buyers, home buyers currently, even with low rates, have said that they would sell their home if the house of their dreams came available or they could move to a more affordable area. Matt, you mentioned the fact 50% there saying that they would be, I guess, open to moving if their dream home was available. What are some of those other top reasons or other motivating factors that you're seeing for people that maybe have been hesitant to list their house to put it up for sale? Yeah, I think the, the survey has told us a few things in addition to finding that dream home. One, job opportunity or relocation. Uh, we saw a, a preponderance of that. We also saw um, folks that ultimately wanted to move to more affordable areas, be it within the, the area that they live or even beginning to move from state to state into the Sunbelt states and other areas to find a more affordable execution. And in some respects, you've got the baby boomer population that's beginning to downsize, which ultimately should provide inventory to those first time home buyers and others. Okay, and at the same time, you still have a lot of the new home builders that are trying to kind of backfill for where there has been underproduction. What are we seeing on that new home side and, and financing options there? Yeah, we've seen some the numbers kind of move around a little bit this year. And in, in September, we saw single family home starts raise or, or be adjusted upwards to 759,000, up from 679,000 in April. And then here recently, we've seen it move a little bit less. That said, there's the permit process is very active. So we do expect, expect sales of new single family homes and ultimately that development aspect that you're speaking of to continue to increase as we head into 24. Matt, there's been so much talk about what mortgage rates need to fall to in order to spur some of this activity that maybe we already are starting to see when it comes to the fact that homeowners are a bit more open maybe to putting their house up for sale. The focus that we have been placing on the need for the 30-year fixed mortgage rate to drop to about 6%, somewhere in the 55 6% range, in order to see an uptick in inventory. Is that a bit overdone or do you still see a need for mortgage rates to fall a bit more? Hey, I, I think that that's an individual decision mm -hmm. by all of the prospective homeowners. I think the advice that I've always given in this type of environment is, is go and buy a home when you're financially ready and a home meets your needs, because ultimately, regardless of the rates, and our survey reinforces this, that rate is sometimes a shorter duration because of the refinance activity that you may have in 12, 16, 18 months. And I think consumers are beginning to see with recent recent rates coming down and then some of the commentary from ourselves and others very publicly that we expect to see rates to be to come down as we head into the middle and latter half of next year is adding confidence that while they may have some short term challenges from a rate perspective, that those won't have a long duration to them and they can capitalize on refinance activity in the future. All right, Matt, thanks so much for joining us here. Matt Vernon, Bank of America's Head of Consumer Lending. Thanks. Well, that does it for us today. But keep right here on Yahoo Finance, Michelle Akufo and Akiko Fujita have you for the next hour. We'll see you tomorrow.
Welcome to Yahoo Finance. It's 11 a.m. on the East Coast, 8 a.m. on the West. I'm Rochelle Akufa with Akiko Fujita. Here's a look at what we're watching this morning. Consolidating in the skies, Alaska Airlines has come to an agreement to buy Hawaiian Airlines, but will it face the same roadblocks as JetBlue and Spirit? We'll discuss. And cash cutback, Spotify is laying off another 17% of its workforce, marking the third round of cuts this year. The company CEO saying being lean is a necessity. Plus, going for gold, the commodity hit a new record surging past $2,100 before paring back its gains. Is another rally on the horizon. First, though, let's take a look at where markets are trading. We are 90 minutes into the trading day. Remember, we're coming off of five straight weeks of gains for stocks. Not necessarily the case today as we look at all three majors. The Dow down 158 points, the S&P 500 down 45, and the Nasdaq, the biggest loser on the day so far, down about 1.7% there. Bitcoin certainly seeing a lot of momentum today, uh, passing that $41,000 mark, uh, notching a 19-month high that amounts to roughly 3.7% gain. They're going to be talking a bit more about what's behind the rally there. Also, as we're Michelle mentioned gold kicking off the week with another record spot prices hitting above the $2,100 level. Uh, Taking a look at Treasury yields right now, we are seeing them all moving higher. The 10-year at 4.29 and the 30-year yield at 4.45. We are starting with some big merger news, though, today. Alaska Air has agreed to buy Hawaiian Airlines for roughly $1.9 billion. Alaska will pay $18 per share for Hawaiian, a significant premium to its current share price. The deal provides a critical lifeline to an airline hurt by a slow return in tourism, but it still faces Faces regulatory hurdles. Let's bring in Yahoo Finance anchor Brad Smith, uh, who is on that beat for us today. And Brad, of course, this comes as the DOJ wraps up its case to block that merger between JetBlue and Spirit Airlines. Is yeah. this merger announced today going down the same path? Well, it certainly seems like it, at least from the company's perspective. There were kind of three main things that we were able to take away from the conversation that we had this morning with Ben Minicucci, the Alaska Airlines CEO, as well as Peter Ingram, who is the Hawaiian Airlines CEO, who both joins us and ultimately broke down some of what, from their perspective, is going to help get this across the finish line. You mentioned the vitals of this. The all-cash transaction, $18 a share, really puts this uh, value at about $1.9 billion deal, and it comes years after Alaska Airlines, which has been making some very strategic M&A acquisitions and activity over the past few years, had acquired Virgin America, and that kind of increased some of the routes. So this added on now years later really gives them an opportunity, at least in terms of some of the contiguous U.S. routes that would be run between these two airlines here. But it also brings one of the sunsetting of the great creative stock tickers for Hawaiian Airlines once the steal is consummated. Ticker symbol HA, H-A, ultimately shares moving higher here on the day by about 175 percent on the back of this announcement. But in terms of what I was mentioning a moment ago, the three things that they really outlined here, and one of them that could really help get this over the finish line is that you're not seeing a major overlapping of some of the routes. So ultimately, that wouldn't be a consolidation of the optionality, at least in full force, that the consumers uh, would expect. But one of the other things that we were able to ask about as well was what they're going to do in terms of the brand strategy. That's been an area that regulators have cast some cold water on in previous mergers and acquisitions in the sky. You think back to what took place even between Virgin America and Alaskan Air, and that was one of the major hangups there, the branding and the elements there. Also, you could even think back to American Air and U.S. Airways when they came together, branding once again and the optionality that consumers were going to be able to see there. So a lot of what's old, perhaps new again, at least in what we're expecting from the regulatory authorities that are going to be looking across this. But in terms of what the executives are expecting, here's what they had to say on the likelihood of this deal getting through and what it ultimately means. We only have uh, a dozen uh, overlap routes in total out of about 1,400 flights for the combined carrier. So uh, I think when the the regulators look at this deal on its own merits, uh, they'll see that it's pro-consumer, pro-competitive, and we're going to add competition uh, for the big four network carriers that are far larger uh, than the combined company will be even after the merger. 
And then just one added note here on this uh, that we were able to discuss with them. It's been a major year for some of the collective bargaining agreements. The past 12 months, uh, we have seen the airline operators be really at those conversations and at the table with pilots. And so that is something that we were able to discuss with them as well here, just briefly as I think back uh, to what was brought up within that conversation. The labor costs, the fuel costs, two of the variables they say that are the most impactful to their bottom line. So those are the things that they really have to work on and make sure that they have a product to consumers and customers that's compelling enough to make sure that they are the airline of choice. That is what they had to say on uh, the negotiations that have taken place there. Uh, we could go even further down the line and discuss some of the aircraft fleet orders, but only if people's eyes won't gloss over at the end of the day. I find it pretty sexy. Uh, people should know what they're flying on. No, absolutely. And of course, you know, always looking for consumers to see if they're going to end up with a more competitive price here. Regulators will have their eyes wide open, though. Appreciate you. Our very own anchor, Brad Smith. Thanks so much. Yeah, thanks. Well, taking a look at Bitcoin climbing higher today, jumping above 41,000 after briefly climbing as high as 42,000. As investors speculate the likelihood of a spot ETF and bet big on the end of rate hikes. Yahoo Finance's David Hollerith is here to talk about these recent moves. So, David, there is some positivity fueling the hype. But historically, how has Bitcoin performed? Uh, to the closed out the year. Yeah, Rochelle, absolutely. Um, you know, right now, uh, Bitcoin is up about 150% uh, year to date. So it's on pace to have its uh, second best year of performance for the past six years. So if we look back at um, 2018, 2019, uh, 2020, 2021, 2022, um, you know, we're seeing in 2019, um, it's, it was up about 90%. 2020 is obviously the biggest year. Um, on record of for what we have. Um, and then 2022 last year was uh, the biggest drop and Bitcoin has had bigger, bigger drops in the past, but it kind of highlights uh, what 2023 has been is uh, it's been a sort of an outrageous recovery of the asset, despite a lot of uh, regulatory uncertainty, at least in the US. Um, so uh, right now, uh, since Bitcoin has crossed the $42,000 mark, um, earlier this morning, um, it, it's it's set to basically where the price was trading uh, before a lot of the calamity in the industry took place in the spring of last year, which led to a number of blowups. And that sort of set a reset um, and also a lot of uh, regulatory crackdowns in the U.S., which sort of started the beginning of this year of, of how we saw the market um, sort of changing. So, you know, as far as what's going on next year, I think that there's a a lot of hopes about uh, next year in terms of the macroeconomic environment and also some industry specific things, uh, a little bit less regulatory risks in some uh, areas that are leading traders to be a lot more optimistic about it. So, um, David, can we talk about that optimism? I mean, there are some calls yeah. right now that, that are pretty bullish. $100,000 yeah. going into 2020, 2024? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not I'm not sure about the calls, but I, you know, I I think essentially what you have is you have this uh, Bitcoin spot ETF, which has been you know the story for many months, and that's become increasingly optimistic, at least from a trader standpoint, um, and that's because uh, you know the SEC is we, we have uh, reports that the SEC is actually engaging with some of the people who are applying to issue, so it looks like those conversations are still happening. So that might be on the table. Then we also sort of have this everything rally that's happening across markets where, you know, people are getting more optimistic about um, the Federal Reserve being finished uh, with interest rate hikes and the cuts could even be coming next year. Um, and then we also have uh, Binance recently uh, settled, had their settlement with the Justice Department. And that was hanging over the, the market as sort of one of the known last shoes to drop in the industry in terms of um, you know, all the things that happened last year, uh, FTX uh, going bankrupt, obviously being the largest, sort of uh, taking some of the risk out of the market. And so that's opening up um, more investors to sort of look at crypto again and, and feel a little bit more comfortable with what's going on. I mean, and then the, the other thing, Bitcoin has a supply cut that's coming next year too. So that means the issuance will be cut. And this is usually preceded um, a rally in, in Bitcoin for the following year. So that's another thing that, you know, Bitcoin believers are, are really optimistic about. Um, so all that to say, uh, a lot of uh, potential uh, 
uh, tailwinds, but then also too, there's a lot of uh, court cases still going on with the SEC and other uh, companies, Coinbase and Binance, uh, both still in the courts. And you know, neither of those cases will be finished anytime soon. So plenty of uncertainty, but it seems like a lot more optimism in the recent weeks. Uncertainty and volatility seems to be certainly the, the steady word there around Bitcoin, but we'll be watching. David Hollerith, thanks so much for that. Well, shares of Carvana are jumping this morning after J.P. Morgan analysts raised their outlook for the online used car seller. The analysts boosted their rating to neutral from underweight and lifted its price target to $40 a share from $25. The analyst saying that it is possible for Carvana to navigate this uncertain macro and used car phase in a way that limits downside. The stock is now trading just above that 12-month target. Carvana is up more than 750% year to date as the company attempts to turn itself around with a debt restructuring plan and by selling new stock. That's the plus side, Rochelle, but as always with Carvana, we've got to talk about where it's come from. We're looking at $38 a share right now at its high. At its high, it was at $380 a share. So you've still got a lot, a lot more room to run, but you could argue that in many ways, it, it, this is... I guess some analysts would say kind of closer to fair value, given the exuberance and the incredible run up, some would argue the irrational run up that it saw at the peak of the pandemic. It's true. I mean, and it has been something of a roller coaster. And um, Rajat Gupta, who's one of the analysts uh, in that note, had previously knocked the wind out of that year to date rally that we had seen from Carvana, saying that the company, the stock price was disconnected from fundamentals. But seeing some optimism here, especially as Carvana is leaning into more of its business to business aspects. And they also said that they believe that Carvana's approach to retailing used vehicles had given it that multi year head start. Had to do a little bit of work here on the debt, as we mentioned with the debt restructuring. You have higher interest rates, higher prices. So interesting to see some optimism here. Perhaps Carvana can make up some of this ground, but certainly at least the stock being lifted on that note this morning. Yeah, Rochelle, you know, I'm going to be curious to be watching the competition in this space. Remember, it was just a few weeks ago that Carvana shares tumbled about 5% on the back of Amazon making that announcement about that partnership with Hyundai to start selling cars on the platform. So interesting space to watch, to say the least. Indeed. I'll, I'll reserve judgment until I, until I see a, a, a few more quarters here. I'm, I'm not completely uh, convinced on Carvana's future right now. But, all right. Well, coming up, the Fed versus the markets. It's been a knockdown, drag out fight all year. Can we expect the conflict to intensify in 2024? Our very own Jennifer Schoenberger has those answers next. You might be surprised to know that healthcare stocks have been lagging the S&P 500 this year. That's despite being the source of one of the buzziest trends, the enthusiasm over weight loss drugs GLP-1s. Eli Lilly has been the big winner because of Manjaro, but elsewhere, it's been a mixed bag as drug makers normalize post-pandemic and grapple with government pricing pressures. More recently, investors have been scrutinizing headlines about health insurance M&A. Should you be positioned in healthcare stocks? And if so, where? We'll tell you in our new Yahoo Finance series, Goodbye or Goodbye. Three times a week, you'll get insights from investing pros on how to build your portfolio.
It is the Federal Reserve versus the stock market. Stocks pulling back this morning as doubts creep in over the prospects for a U.S. interest rate cut. Wall Street sees interest rate cuts by next May, with the possibility they happen as soon as March. But that doesn't align with public statements from most Fed officials in recent weeks. Let's bring in Yahoo Finance's John Sch Jen Schonberger for more on this story. And Jen, there's always this constant push and pull between where the markets are and the Fed is. And the Fed chair last week kind of going out of his way to set expectations. Yep, that's right. The Fed's still trying to decide whether they've reached the peak on rates, but Wall Street already pricing in rate cuts as soon as March. Investors betting that falling inflation and the expectation that the economy will slow markedly will cause the Federal Reserve to cut rates. Take a look at the CME Fed funds futures this morning. They were pricing in a 53% chance of a rate cut in March flip to May, and some are already starting to price in another rate cut on top of that as well. But the Fed may not cut rates as soon as investors think. Uh, Fed officials last week suggested they are intent to hold rates higher for longer. Fed Chair Jay Powell tried to warn war markets on Friday to no avail that, quote, it would be premature to conclude with confidence that we've achieved a sufficiently restrictive stance or to speculate on when policy might ease. He said we're prepared to tighten policy further if it becomes appropriate to do so. Also last week, we heard from New York Fed President John Williams on rate cuts, calling them a hypothetical, something that's far off in the future. Fed officials worry that if they were to put out language that they are even finished raising rates or to talk about rate cuts, that could loosen financial conditions, making their fight to bring inflation back down to 2% in a timely manner a much more longer battle. Next week, the Fed widely expected to hold rates steady at their December policy meeting. We will also be getting new interest rate projections then, where officials are again expected to signal that they will hold rates higher for longer next year. Back to you. And Jennifer, of course, we're going to be looking for that jobs data as well. Any, anything that looks like things are trading in the right direction. How much harder does this make the Fed's job to keep towing that line of saying we're not done yet when markets just don't believe them right now? Absolutely, Rochelle. If we get another cooler read on jobs data this Friday, something that's in line with a rebalancing in the job market, that will be encouraging for the Fed's inflation fight. But I think you'll need to hear from Pell next week that, hey, we still need to see more data to make sure that this trend is still intact, that it is not a head fake. The last thing they want is for markets to loosen policy even further, right? We've seen a backup in the yield on long-term treasuries, the yield on the 10-year coming back down from that 5% level at a very torrid pace. And so it is up to Fed officials to continue jawboning to really try to signal to markets like, hey, hey, guys, these rate cuts are not coming as fast as you think. They'll be choosing his words carefully, I'm sure. <laughs> Our very own Jennifer Schoenberger. Thank you, as always. Well, it looks likely that the Federal Reserve will hold interest rates at its policy meeting next week, but investors want to know what's in store for the new year. Fed Chair Jay Powell has been making signals that we should not count on rate cuts, but the market seems to feel otherwise. Joining us now is Octavio Morenzi, Optimus Chief Executive Officer. So, Octavio, what is your take on this? Do the markets have it right? Are they calling the Fed's bluff here? <laughs> Listen, Jay Powell is a remarkably simple central banker to actually understand. He's, he's remarkably clear and to the point. And I think so far he's basically says what he means and means what he says. And so I, I would take him at his word when he says higher for longer. Uh, don't count on rates coming down anytime soon. I mean, he has got in his, his econometric department have sort of got some of the forecasts badly wrong over the course of the past year. But I think he's sincere in terms of what he says. So I will take him at his word. I think the market might well get, be getting ahead of itself here. We've seen a run up in so many different asset classes, be bonds, equities, gold, Bitcoin, all those different areas, basically predicate on the idea that Fed is going to cut interest rates uh, severely in, in, in 2024. I don't see much evidence for that right now. And I think there might be a very, very big disappointment if that doesn't come to pass. So, Octavia, what does that mean in terms of the recent rally that we've seen in the markets? We're seeing a bit of a breather today after five straight weeks of gains. But if what we take the Fed chair at is where those rate cuts aren't coming soon, are we likely to see this rally fizzle out? 
I think like we've seen one or two rallies before fizzle out over the course of the past year or two. We've seen that happen before where the market basically thinks, well, they must cut rates now. They can't possibly carry on increasing them. And what comes to pass is that, in fact, they do keep rates higher. They're going to keep them there longer. And I think we might well see this rate fizzle out as well, this, this rally fizzle out as well. Now, um, that being said, it's very hard to get yourself inside the uh, Federal Open Markets Committee head and try and figure out exactly what they're thinking. There's different people on that committee who are going to vote in different directions. So it's, it's somewhat difficult to say exactly where it's going to go and say that with any sort of certainty. But I think the balance of the risks are basically that we see the Fed not touch interest rates now or in January or in February and March, that basically they're going to sort of adopt a wait and see strategy and basically wait for inflation to come down very, very slowly. Bear in mind, it shot up much faster than they thought. It stayed higher much longer than they thought. They don't want to make the same mistake again and leave inflation too high. So they're going to err on the side of caution here and basically leave those rates up there, I think. And that's where the balance of the risks are. And I think we might see a lot of people disappointed this rally is, does not have legs that it's going to fizzle out again. And obviously, investors are wondering how much data is enough? How consistent does this data need to be? And at what point do you think it does make it a little bit difficult for the Fed to keep towing that line if inflation continues to go down and if we do see a jobs number that ticks up with unemployment? Well, the job numbers have been very encouraging. So the economy seems to have carried on going. Uh, I, I would say over the course of the past year, I can't remember a period where economic forecasts have been as bad as they have been. So I think that's worth uh, taking into account. We've basically seen a lot of people forecasting where the economy is going. They were a year ago or even six months ago. There were all sorts of forecasts about the economy going to hit a, a, a crater and go into some sort of deep recession. and Unemployment will shoot up. If you look back a year, some people were talking about an absolute hurricane coming to hit the U.S. economy. None of that has come to pass. And all the forecasts about inflation numbers and things like that have also proven to be very, very badly wrong. So I think taking that into account, one has to say, well, these economic numbers, yes, they look kind of encouraging, good, and should be ammunition for the Fed to actually do the opposite, not cut rates, but keep them higher. So if another strong job reports comes in, and it looks like we're going to probably get 200,000 jobs added this, this uh, latest month, the Fed might well say, well, the job market looks fine. There's no need for us to cut interest rates at this stage. We can keep them up there higher for longer, and we can uh, make sure the markets don't get ahead of themselves on that front. So I think that's what we're going to see. They're basically going to say, no, Numbers look good. Uh, the unemployment numbers are encouraging. The economy seems to carry on going forward at full steam. There's no need to cut interest rates. Yeah, Octavio, you talk about the disappointment of some investors that these rates will remain higher for longer. Those cuts aren't coming soon. I mean, you could argue away from equities, we've already seen that expectation shift. We were talking about gold hitting a new record, at least with spot prices. Bitcoin, I don't know where you want to put that in the mix. That's rallying as well. What are you looking outside of the equity space as a potential hedge in the expectation that the Fed moves as you've described? Well, so if if the basically you, you want to be going short bonds and going short the interest rate, if the market now expects the interest rates to go down uh, and basically it's going to go up instead or stay higher than they thought, that means the yields on bonds are going to go back up. So basically going short bonds is going to be sort of the approach to doing that. And there's various different ETFs that you can invest in to do that, to basically go the opposite direction and uh, take advantage of that trend. But that's kind of a risky thing. I, I think really at the moment from sort of a retail investor perspective, the yields we're seeing on sort of very, very safe assets, sort of very short-term U.S. Treasuries are still looking very attractive. So they're still about 5% on the short end of the yield curve in the six months and one year U.S. Treasuries. And that looks like a really great place to park money and take the zero risk. It's very hard to say where things are going to go. That being said, if you do that strategy, you might well miss a, a very strong bull rally if basically the Fed does then cut interest rates uh, sometime in the future. So we're looking at a risky situation right now. But I think a very tempting thing is to basically sit on the sidelines, not invest in anything, basically push into short-term bonds and wait and see what happens. Um, and I think that's probably the, the very conservative but very safe strategy that's paying a, a very nice dividend at the moment. And Octavia, what's the biggest mistake you tend to see people make in this sort of risky environment? The biggest mistake, I think, is to sort of be chasing the market and, and be uh, sort of a, a day late into getting all the hot in investment classes uh, after they've had a big rally and a big pop. So we've seen a lot of ups and downs, a lot of volatility, be it gold prices, be it oil prices, be it Bitcoin prices, equities. Uh, and if you're sort of chasing that uh, big jump, uh, and you're tempted to get into a market because you've seen a big rally the day before, I see that mistake happening a lot. But basically people saying, I'm going to chase that market, I'm going to be a follower, and I'm just a day late. And as a result, I get very, very poor returns. So I think that's the biggest and consistent mistake we see. Don't try to time the market. The big takeaway there, as we've often heard, Octavio Morenzi, Opima's CEO, good to talk to you today. Appreciate the time. 
Well, coming up, Spotify shares popping today after announcing its third round of job cuts this year. We're going to dive deeper into this decision by the music streamer on the other side. It is time now for our chart of the day. Spotify preparing to yet again pare back its staff, cutting 17% of employees in the third round of layoffs this year. Like many tech companies, Spotify saw explosive staffing growth during the pandemic. Headcount more than doubled during the past three years, with investors more focused on profitability than growth. Spotify has turned its focus to cutting costs, most notably in its podcast division. And Rochelle, you know, it's worth noting that this is coming on the back of uh, what was a surprise profit in the third quarter. Um, stronger than expected subscriber growth. So things sort of moving in the right direction. And yet the fact that we're hearing about more cuts from the company points to just the, the rapid rate with which the company scaled, um, which is certainly, you know, Spotify is not alone. We've heard that from so many tech companies. It's true, and especially those who, who really soared during the pandemic. I mean, when you look at what they were spending on some of these celebrity podcasts, of course, Joe Rogan is always the one that comes to mind. But they also had a lot of expensive licensing deals with, with record labels and with music publishers as well, adding to those costs. And we saw the CEO saying the platform now needs to, to right size. This is a very different environment that they have to be used to. And he noted the gap between the financial goal state and the current operational cost. It is more expensive to borrow when you're in a high interest rate environment. So all of that adding up here. So we have to wonder what the new normal for Spotify is going to look like. If they, as we mentioned, still getting the subscribers, but still having to cut these costs as well, Akika. Yeah, it does feel like the challenge, so many streaming services, not just streaming audio, but streaming video services we've talked so much about. It is about investing in the content, but also keeping a close watch on having the content to bring additional user growth on board. By the way, the, the company has set a pretty ambitious target, saying they want to generate $100 billion in revenue by 2030. It's going to be interesting to see how they sort of combine the cost cutting with the additional investments needed in trying to get the additional growth, the additional revenue coming in in this environment. It's true, and it's a, it's a balancing act that they're having to do in a very competitive market. There's, there's a lot of podcasting platforms out there, so we'll have to see how Spotify 
positions itself. Well, let's continue this chat because in that move to slash costs, Spotify cutting its staff for its third round of layoffs since the start of 2023. As we mentioned there, the company announcing over the weekend it will let around 1,500 employees go. In a letter to staff, Spotify CEO noted that being lean is a necessity for the company moving forward. Will the latest cuts be enough to boost confidence in the company's profitability? Joining us now is Jason Bazinet, Managing Director at Citigroup. Jason, are you convinced that this is enough to turn things around? Well, I don't know if it's about turning it around. I, I would reframe it and say, you know, just about everything is going right at Spotify. I mean, they've had 25 to 30 million um, net ads to their premium platform. The top line growth has been above 10%. They've announced price increases in 50 markets. You know, the US price increase is, is yet to unfurl on the income statement. They've launched audiobooks. Now they've cut costs. If you're a shareholder, I mean, you love everything about everything I just said, which is one of the reasons why the stock is now up about 140% this year. Uh, Jason, you know, we, we were talking about just the, that billion dollar bet that the company made on podcasts. You know, verdict's still out, but you could argue some of the really big names they brought in, all of it hasn't necessarily materialized. As you think about this current path for Spotify, what does that revenue mix look like? Is it about subscriber growth? Is it about ad growth? I mean, how does that all break down? Um, what's the path forward? Well, I, I would think about it this way. Um, this company doesn't have very many employees, um, whether it's before or after this layoff, right? And the reason is most of the reason consumers pay Spotify money is the value of the content that they bring to the consumers, which principally... Um, is the record labels, right? So uh, what Spotify, I think, is on a journey to do with podcasts and with audiobooks that they launched earlier this year, I think is to convince the consumer to pay more money, but then be able to turn around to the record labels and say, hey, the money the consumer's paying us is not inextricably linked to the IP that you own, that we, Spotify, have to pay for. That's the long-term journey, decoupling their revenues, from very high sort of cost of goods. And when you look at the, the advertising space, how attractive is a Spotify versus some other platforms? You know, the, the, the ad platform at Spotify really doesn't generate any money for the firm. Um, what it's really used for is an acquisition funnel. So the idea is to give the consumer free Spotify that's ad supported and then jam them with so many ads that they just get frustrated and decide to toggle into the paid service. So, um, you know, the ad business itself doesn't really generate any gross profits, any EBITDA, any free cash flow. It's just an, an acquisition vehicle. It's one of the reasons why Spotify's um, aggregate marketing outlays are quite low. Um, you know, you don't really see many Spotify ads. The reason is, is that that ad tier is really the acquisition vehicle, <laughs> if that makes sense. Jason, you said just about everything's going right for Spotify, and yet recently you downgraded the stock from a buy to neutral. What will it take for you to change your call? Well, I, you know, I always get nervous when stocks are up a lot and when everyone loves it, right? And, and you know, one of the challenges in my seat is to um, try and zig when everyone's zagging. So we're neutral now. What what would get me more constructive on the stock? I think it would essentially be sell side estimates becoming a bit more achievable. Let me just give you two examples. Um, this company has never generated more than four hundred and fifty million dollars of free cash flow a year, going all the way back to sixteen. They're probably going to do about three hundred and fifty or four hundred million this year. The street has them doing a billion one two years from now. That's a massive step up. So I'd like to see some of those numbers come down. The other thing I'd like to see is we have about, I don't know, seven years of history where the ARPUs have fallen and the churn rate has fallen. And that makes perfect sense. People, you know, leg into the duo plan or the family plan. They get a lower price per user that causes them to churn less. What the sell side is modeling going forward is churn continuing to fall, but the ARPU is going up. And that may happen, but we've never seen that before. And so I'd like to see more conservatism on, on those metrics as well in terms of what's embedded Jason, in the consensus. And, yeah. and Jason, as we look at some of the, the other options that Spotify is leaning into, especially things like audiobooks, when it comes to cost cutting, where else do you still, still see it being able to trim while striking that balance with growth? 
Yeah, I think, I mean, my, so much of their costs are really in the money they pay to the content owners or the, or the record labels that sit in between or increasingly in the future book publishers um, that I don't think that there's a lot more cost that they can cut in terms of direct um, headcount costs. So I think we're sort of done with that, with that chapter of the narrative with today's cuts. I, I think uh, the CEO alluded to it in his letter that they contemplated sort of dribbling these cost cuts out in terms of headcount reductions um, through 24 into 25, and they just decided to bite the bullet and do it in one fell swoop, which is great. Jason Bazinet, City Managing Director. Always good to have you on the show. Appreciate the time. You bet. Well, coming up, housing hurdles heading into 2024. We're going to dive into the major issues in real estate from inventory to rising prices. That's coming up on the other side. Housing inventory typically slides in November, but this year it actually rose. That's according to a report from Realtor.com. So what's driving the increase? For more on this, let's bring in our very own Danny Romero, who's watching this one closely. Um, Danny, what's behind the uptick? Secret that the U.S. is short of homes. Mortgage rates have been no help sidelining potential buyers, but there's new data out from Realtor.com that shows a different story on the housing front. So let's take a look at those November figures. In November of this year, there were over 754,000 homes for sale. That's a, according to their database. That's 1% higher than it was last year where there were over 748,000 homes for sale. And that's 48% higher than the height of the pandemic uh, housing boom, the frenzy that happened November 2021. There were over 500,000 homes for sale. Now, this also was a time when homes were selling super fast, and so they weren't being registered as inventory. But overall, inventory is still well below pre-pandemic levels, 34% from November 2019 levels when there were just over a million homes for sale. Now let's dive into the month over month shifts from October to November. Remember in October, mortgage rates were hovering over 8% crushing affordability. In November of this year, there were a, there was a gain of over 17,000 homes for sale, Realtor.com reported. Now, if we compare that to last year, 
there was a loss of over 2,000 homes for sale between October to November. Why was there an increase? Mortgage rates spiked in the fall, hovering around that 8%, pricing out buyers, resulting in more homes staying on the market for longer periods of time. But what is the big picture here? These figures really highlight that the housing market really underwent a cooling period for November. But with more inventory on the market, that means more transactions, more sales, and we're moving toward that somewhat more balanced market, Akiko. Well, I'll pick it up from here. Appreciate you joining us with that update. Our very own Danny Romero. Thanks so much. Well, staying in real estate, home prices reaching those record highs in September from August. That's according to the latest Case-Shiller Home Price Index. Now, that makes eight straight months of gains for the index. And that's despite historically high mortgage rates and low existing home sales. For more on this, Lot Fee Karui, Goldman Sachs Chief Credit Analyst, joins us now. Thank you for joining us. So, Lot Fee, walk us through some of the nuances and what we're seeing in the demand and the prices here. I mean, you're right. Uh, the Case-Shiller Index does show a 4.6% appreciation on a year-over-year -year basis as of September, which is a very, very strong showing. Uh, I think the big picture has been roughly the same over the last you know, couple of quarters, which is a tug of war between very challenging affordability on the one hand, driven by historically high mortgage rates, and then on the other hand, very tight levels of inventories, some of that reflects structural reasons, the fact that we've underbuilt pretty much since the end of the global financial crisis, and also very weak transaction volumes. Now, in that tug of war, tight inventories has sort of kept the upper hand, and the result is the strong price appreciation that we've seen. For 2024, I think what you'll see is a gradual cooling down of that market where uh, we're going to continue to bring uh, more supply gradually, and that should help rebalance the market a little bit. Uh, our forecast is that by the end of 2024, we'll likely go back to a 2% uh, type of uh, house price appreciation to environment, which is roughly around the trend of the last you know, 30 years or so. Uh, Latvia, on that point that you said about just the lack of inventory, this is, of course, not an issue that we're dealing with because of mortgage rates, right? It goes back several years, as you point out. Just the building hasn't, just construction hasn't kept up. Uh, from an affordability standpoint, what does that ultimately mean? Mortgage rates come down a little, but at the end of the day, we're still looking at high prices, right? Absolutely. I think you need to interact the two. You do need to see some relief in terms of mortgage rates, which would normalize affordability. But you also need to build more and maybe also, you know, do a little bit more to allow for that ownership transfer from the baby boomers to the millennials to take place, because that's been sort of the other big constraint on, 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 on house prices is that, you know, existing home sales have essentially moved to all time low levels, partly because there's very little that is transacting. But you're right. The first order condition is to bring back more supply into the market. And the only way to do that is to build a little bit more. And when we add to that also, you have a lot of aging homes still on the market as well. But even when you look at how home builders stocks have fared year to date, double digit growth here. At what point then does, do we start to see some balance here between inventory and supply? Well, I think most home builders have been managing their inventories in a lot in, in a way that is a lot more conservative. Uh, you know, a lot of that honestly reflects some of the lessons learned during the global financial crisis in 2008, 2009. I don't think we should expect a lot of change. I think, you know, the levels of inventories will remain managed in a fairly conservative way that just call it a trauma of what happened in, in, in 08, 09. And so the, the issue is really uh, you know, whether you could ha you could see a, a, a bit of an improvement in the way affordability interacts with uh, w with inventories. But, you know, the way home builders manage those inventories will likely remain the same. Lafie, where, what role does regulation play in all of this? When we talk about the balancing out, we have seen in places like California easing of regulation so you can increasingly convert office spaces into apartment rentals. Is that going to have to play a bigger role here in order for that balance to return? 
Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. Repurposing, you know, is potentially one avenue that could help rebalance the market a little bit. I would keep in mind, however, that, you know, that's expensive and it makes case in some, it makes sense in some cases. It doesn't make sense in, in, in other cases, but that's certainly one, one avenue that is worth exploring. I think the other takeaway for me, at least, is that, you know, yes, we've had strong house price appreciation you know uh, across the board but if you scratch the surface a little bit what you see is a fair amount of variability across the regions and so you know western cities for example have already seen some weakness and so that's evidence that the market is getting rebalanced there the midwest and the northeast on the other hand have seen continued appreciation so there's certainly some room to to, to go there but repurposing is definitely one one area that is that could actually contribute to rebalance the market. And so, Lofi, as we look for some of what's being constructed to match the needs, you mentioned this demographic shift from baby boomers. You also have millennials who have the money, who want to get into a home that's also sort of leaning into some of these high prices as well. At what point do we see some of those demographics moderate as well? Are millennials then going to keep propping up these prices? No, that's a, that's the low frequency trend. It won't happen overnight. It's a multi year process. I think you know, like I said earlier, that ownership transfer that everyone was expecting from the baby boomers to the millennials is is taking a lot more time to unfold. The only way to accelerate it is to actually build a, a bit more and bring more new supply in, into the market. Latfi Karui, Goldman Sachs Chief Credit Analyst. Uh, good to get your perspective on what has been a very tough market. Appreciate the time. Thanks for having me. All your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
gold hitting a record high this morning, touching $2,100, but since pulling back. But there's another rally on the horizon as geopolitical uncertainty continues and investors bet on future rate cuts. Mike McGlone, Bloomberg Intelligence senior macro strategist, joins us now. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. So for people who are trying to get a handle on the correlation between what we've seen with gold prices historically and the S&P 500 here, what does that lay out about the path ahead recession wise? Gold up, S&P 500 down, I think is a potential trajectory for next year. The key thing right now is gold is just kind of frustrating to those people, made a new high. And then we, uh, late basically last night, $2,135 an ounce. And now it's just trying to see if it can hold that support around $2,000 an ounce. That used to be resistance. I think it will. But I think you mentioned the key factor is if the stock market keeps going up and U.S. interest rates stay high, and there's not a re- lot of reason for gold. But I think that's all transitioning. Now, one of the things today is the market's price for a lot of Fed ease next year, Fed fund futures, so almost 100 basis points by this time next year, which might be more an issue for the stock market. But the way I see gold is the deepest pockets on the planet are buying gold. That's central banks. Now, ETFs haven't really been much buyers, but I think gold is in the early days of a bull market breaking out to new highs and um, just frustrating some people by not continuing. Uh, Mike, you know, we often sort of simplify the gold trade by talking about it being a safe haven. Um, What's different about this rally that we have seen? It it certainly feels like it's got more legs to run. Well, what's different specifically today is there's the digital alternative. It's one thing I was, I'm not surprised gold's knocking around and driving people crazy around $2,000 an ounce. It's been doing that for three years. But it's the fact that despite the stock market being down, down, digital gold, Bitcoin is up a lot today. So I think it, it sticks with my narrative that this is not our father's gold market. You really can't hold gold anymore or have interest in gold without some Bitcoin in that space because it's better fit for the world going digital. So I'm bullish gold. I'm less bullish Bitcoin if the stock market goes down, but it's proving divergent strength. So to me, that's the key thing that's different is um, that there's that alternative in digital gold. And so, Mike, how would you compare gold versus other commodities that you have your eye on heading into 2024? A good assessment. That's a real, it's a significant recessionary trajectory. So virtually all commodities going down, um, industrial metals, 15% or so, energy commodities down almost 20%, grains down almost 20%, and gold going a clear recessionary trajectory from um, commodities. The key question is, does something stop it or does it accelerate next year? In my advice, it's going to accelerate. We have issues. We see what's happening in China, potentially recession already in Europe, U.S. tilting towards recession. We look at leading economic indicators and Bloomberg intelligence. Yet it was only a few months ago, most central banks were still tightening. So to me, that's the recession, recessionary trajectory for maybe from an, a more of an adult, less speculative market, which might be industrial metals. Versus the U.S. stock market, this might be going up on hopium and, and for cuts, uh, federal rate cuts, which Fed has told us, the chair policy is they're not going to be cutting rates anytime soon, at least not in, I think, the way the market's expecting them to. So we're looking at spot prices right now, Mike, off of that $2,100 high that we saw. How much further do you think it goes or how much higher well, do you uh, think it goes? I, I think gold's going to be heading towards 3000 It's a question of when. It's, I think it looks to me very similar like it did when it leaped and had that issue of 2008. It bumped up against 1000 It dropped around 700 and then it leaped at 1900 I think it's doing something similar. So to me, the key thing right now is how can it hold support around 2000 That's kind of the new support transitioning from old resistance. Um, and right now, it's just frustrating the most. But I, I, I fully expect it to head towards 3000 and maybe even next year. But it's Remember, the deepest po- pockets on the planet are, are buying central banks. They still are. ETF buyers might flip, but I think it's going to take higher prices for what's been selling at ETFs, which is very rare, for them to start flipping towards positive uh, in gold. So, Mike, for people who are new to perhaps investing in gold, not sure how it fits into a portfolio, how should they be thinking about it as an investment? Well, it's easy to invest in gold through ETFs now. I think you look at gold as the base layer of money on the on, on, on the planet. So if you look at like the S&P 500 and divide by gold, I think it's about the same as 1997. If you compare it to land prices, 
it's a very stable measure. It's not affected by the massive pump in liquidity we basically saw from 2000 to 2022. So I, I look at gold as that's a stable measure. Um, and the key thing that's happening right now is that if you look at the price of gold since the we came off the gold standard in 1991, it's, the per ounce price has basically fluctuated between above the S&P 500 and well below the S&P 500. And every time it's been at a significant the price, the level of the S&P 500, the per ounce price of gold, and we have a recession, gold just kind of catches up. So that's why I'm using that 3,000 level. Gold just typically catches up. So you look at equities, historically a little expensive, and gold historically a little cheap versus S&P 500, particularly for a U.S. recession. Okay, $3,000. We're going to mark that one, Mike, see if you can, uh, we'll have you back on the show, maybe if it tracks in that direction. Mike McClone, a Bloomberg Intelligence Senior Macro Strategist. Good to talk to you today. Uh, that does it for our hour here, along with Rochelle Kufo. I'm Akiko Fujita. As we watch the markets here, all trade in the red, all three major indices taking a bit of a breather today, pulling back with the Nasdaq seeing the steepest losses. Much more to come here on Yahoo Finance Live. Keep it right here.